So good morning, uh, everyone. I'm trusting that you can all hear me, so give me a thumbs up if I can see uh, that you're hearing. Councillor Grimes, you're not cooperating. There we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Two thumbs. All right, so good morning, everyone. I'd like to um, call this meeting to order. Uh, my name is Michael Thompson, Councillor. I am the chair of the Economic and Community Development uh, Committee. The clerk has confirmed that we have quorum, so I will call meeting 16 of the Economic and Community Development Committee to order, and I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, today's meeting is being held by video conference. City staff are also connecting to the meeting by video conference. As City Hall remains closed, the public will continue to participate electronically and can watch the meeting streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com backslash Toronto City Council Live. I ask everyone for their patience with any delay and technical issues that may come up. We uh, currently have um, a number of speakers uh, that are registered on uh, items. Item one, I believe at the moment we have about five uh, speakers. The city clerk um, have connected all registered speakers to the meeting by audio. The lists of speakers can be viewed online by visiting the Economic and Community Development Committee's page at toronto.ca backslash council and clicking the speakers box for today's meeting. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone about the important health and safety measures that we must follow today. All in-person participants have been seated two meters apart. Please stay in your designated seat. Do not change seat or sit in another seat that's not been assigned. When entering, exiting, or moving about the room, you must wear a face covering. Sanitization kits has been provided on the desktops. Attendance in committee room one is limited only to those persons who are required for the meeting. A, a number of clerks, audiovisual, and IT staff are with us today. Members, this is a paperless meeting. The city clerk will provide all agenda materials via CMP, the clerk's meeting portal. IT staff will be available both in person and remote members to help with your devices. I would like to remind staff to keep their mics muted and their videos turned off unless they need to answer questions or speak to the committee. This will make it easier for me as chair and for those watching on YouTube to observe members as they participate in the debate and vote on items. Members, please keep your mics muted unless you wish to question staff or speak to an item and ensure that your video is turned on. As part of each agenda item, I will ask members to raise their hands or unmute their mics if they wish to question staff or speak. I will then create a speaker's list and will call in members when it is their turn to speak. When voting on an item or a motion, I ask that members ensure they turn on their video, if applicable, and to raise their hands to indicate their vote. Members, I want to remind you that whether you are participating in today's meeting in person or remotely, you must submit and approve your motions by email. A clerk staff will not print motions for your review if you need to confer with the clerk staff in the room, you must stay two meters apart at all times. Staff are available at ecdc at toronto.ca to help with motions. If there are any members, visiting members of council attending today's meeting, I would encourage you to turn on your videos so that I know that you are present and can give you the opportunity to ask questions of staff or speak. This will also assist the clerk's staff to record attendance for the meeting. Although we are in different locations today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land that we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations. 
the Mississauga of the Credits, the Anishwabie, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Windats people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Are there any declaration of interest on the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? If you have an interest, please raise your hand or unmute your mic and indicate the item number and the nature of your in interests. Okay, I've seen none. Next, we need to uh, move a motion to confirm the minutes from our last meeting on September the 8th. Uh, Vice Chair Grimes is moving the motion. All those in favor, show of hands. Opposed, that's carried. Thank you very much. All right, so let's proceed with a rundown of the, uh, and a review of the, enge the agenda. We have um, eight items on the agenda, and I understand we have a piece of new business from Councillor Cressy, and we'll get to that uh, momentarily. All right, the first item is EC 16.1, Interim Shelter Recovery and Infrastructure Impl Implementation Plan. We're going to be holding that item. Uh, we will be having a presentation from staff, and we have a number of registered speakers. So I'll hold that down, and we'll be hearing from Marianne Bernard, the General Manager of Shelter Support and Housing Administration. <coughs> the next item is uh, EC 16.2. And just before I can read it out, I want to just welcome um, visiting members uh, of Council to the committee, Councillor Paula Fletcher, good morning. And Councillor Fletcher, I'm going good morning. to be, I'm, good morning. I'm going to be holding this item, EC 16.2, Apple Grove Community Complex Operation, in your name. Is that correct? You'd like Thank to Thank you, and I'll be, yes, I'll be submitting a motion to the clerk, and hopefully you'll be uh, moving that for me. Okay, Mr. Chair. fair enough. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Councillor Fletcher. We'll be holding that item down. Uh, Mr. Chair, just Councilor Kersey? forgive the interruption. Um, I, your audio is quite low, and I'm wondering if, if it, it may be that the speaker isn't on, or your mic, or it just is low. <laughs> okay, Councillor Cressy, we will work on that. And it's not that, because yeah? you don't have a booming voice. You do have a booming <laughs> voice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'll second that. It, it's, it's making it so that everyone else is very loud, because we've turned it up for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're just looking over to our IT staff, and they're giving me the thumbs up that they have indicated that they have made some changes. Is this any better? Fantastic. I see two thumbs from Councillor Cressy. Uh, Councillor, oh, you're not sure. Okay. All right. All right. So they're going to work on that in order to raise it so that you can all hear me better. And I appreciate uh, Councillor Cressy bringing this matter to my attention. All right, moving right along, members. Um, the next item is uh, EC 16.3, improving the imagination, manufacturing, innovation, and technology, uh, local, the IMET local employment re um, requirement, extension of a pilot program. Um, okay, I'm just gonna hold that down. I know that Mr. Williams is here, and I'd like to ask him just a couple of questions. Okay. All right, moving right along, our next item is um, EC 16.4, uh, the feasibility of mitigation efforts to prevent misadventure at the Scarborough Bluffs. I know that Councillor Ainsley was here earlier. He does not have any questions. He has been raising this issue for some time. He's indicated that we can move it if there's no speakers on the item. I'm looking to the clerks. There are no speakers uh -huh. on this item. And so, Mr. Chair, if I may hold for a couple of questions of staff, please. Of course, absolutely. Thank you very much. Councillor Lai would like to Thank hold. You. Okay, thank you. It's held in your name, Councillor Lai. Okay, the next item is EC 16.5, request for authority to exercise option years on contract number 47020528 for the provision of firefighters structural bunker suits. Councillor Carroll would like to hold that item. I will hold that in your name, Councillor Carroll. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, 
Yes, uh, Councillor Carroll. Just to indicate, I, I, may, I may have questions of uh, uh, the Director of uh, Procurement as well. He is, he is here. Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you very much, Councillor Carroll. Okay, moving right along to uh, the next item, which is uh, EX 16.6. Support for artists and musicians during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to hold that item. There's been some changes made at the province. Councillor Cressy has um, submitted uh, motions on that item, so we'll hold that. Um, okay. The next item is uh, EEC 16.7. I'm wondering if you could, I don't know where that sound is coming from. If someone, if everyone could just mute their microphone, there's a, um, crackling sound that's coming through, that would be very helpful. So EC 16.7, current impact on COVID-19 uh, on live uh, music venues. Again, we're going to hold that item. Um, okay. and the next item, uh, which is the um, EC 16.8, Toronto's nighttime economy, um, I can What's, move that, Chair. That, what, that one hasn't adjusted with the that's recent correct. provincial and federal announcement. Okay, great. Um, uh, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I'd like to hold this item on the night economy for a couple of questions. Okay, fair enough. Please. So we will hold that in your name, Councillor Lai. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we'll be holding that item. All right, uh, the next item, uh, Councillor Cresci, you have a uh, new business, is that correct? An item of new business? I which is uh, yes, understanding the impact of proposed provincial changes to the child care um, to child care on Toronto's family, right? This is the five-year review. This is is it the item, Council Council Cressy? I uh, that's correct, Speaker. The the province recently announced proposed changes and have requested uh, feedback from stakeholders, including the city. And so this is a letter to request our staff to report back to committee on the proposed changes as part of the five-year review as they've done in the past. Oh, fantastic. So we can add this as uh, a piece of new business. Um, all those in favor? Opposed that carries. And just in the interest of time, um, I know folks, you haven't had a chance to read it as yet, so I'm just gonna give you an opportunity to read it. And as we progress during the course of the day, please, uh, when we get to it, let me know if there's any particular questions or concerns that you may have. Uh, directly or if you wanted to be able to speak to staff offline and then we can bring that forward because this may um, help to facilitate uh, the process okay uh, Councilor Mr. Carroll? Chair yes Councilor Carroll um, I, I might even be able to speed this up even more um, I, I think uh, uh, Deputy City Manager Ms. Carboni was probably uh, already talking about this I had a conversation with her about updating us on uh, particularly these things, the community side of economic and community development. So we're, while we're dealing with the shelter housing and supports uh, uh, today, she was gonna sort of bring a, a, a big report on all the rest in November. So perhaps we could just move to refer uh, Councillor Cressy's motion to the deputy city manager so that that update comes as part of that report at our very next meeting. Councillor Carroll, I think that's, I... Councillor Cressy, comment? Uh, Shell, maybe I, I just want to understand that a little better because I, I had been in conversations with the general manager of children's services on this. So per perhaps we can we can chat offline. I, I just want to understand that more. Fair enough. Okay, I, sure. I'll I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll move to WhatsApp on that. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> but just just to add to that, the, the deputy city manager and I have been speaking about the need to bring forward. Uh, the information has been described by Councillor Carroll. So this information was coming forward. Additionally, the motion uh, that you put forward, Councillor uh, Cressy, which is very helpful, but the staff were going to sort of bring that forward anyway. So this is all, um, if you will, bring it all together. We're all paying attention to all these particular issues, so that's helpful to do that. And I do think that Councillor Carroll's suggestion is very helpful in that we are going to bring an omnibus series of information coming forward, all the things that has been taking place during the last uh, seven months and so on that we may not all be uh, privy to. And, and so it's coming forward as part of the November meeting, the staff and our deputy city manager and staff members and I have been discussing this. So that is coming forward. So this is very helpful. All right, 
Uh, anything further on this particular um, uh, item? So all those in favor in terms of adding it as a, um, a new uh, item of a new business? Opposed? That's carried. Fantastic. That's been added, Councillor Cressy. All right. So, members, we are going now to our first item. We start uh, with item 16.1, the interim recovery and interim shelter recovery and infrastructure implementation plan. We will begin with a staff presentation on this item. We will then hear from the registered uh, public speakers before moving back to committee and um, creating an opportunity where uh, Ms. Bedard um, will be able to uh, answer uh, questions from members of uh, the committee. So I will invite uh, Ms. Bernard to begin her presentation. Uh, good morning, uh, Deputy Mayor. Just checking that my audio is okay. It's fantastic. Good morning. Um, so uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, and thank you committee members for uh, your patience as I just take you through uh, an overview of the report that you have in front of you this morning. If we could move to the next slide. Um, so the report provides an overview of the city's response to homelessness during the pandemic and the key actions that we'd like to take over the next 12 months. The actions identified in the plan are based on what we've learned through the first six months um, and the advice that we've received from the Shelter Recovery Task Force that we convened in partnership with the United Way. And the goal is to ensure that the shelter system is positioned well to respond effectively to a resurgence of COVID-19 this fall and in advance, uh, renewing our focus on permanent housing solutions and also providing information and an update on SSHA's 2021 infrastructure plan, which includes a progress update on the project to uh, create a thousand new uh, shelter beds. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, SSHA partnered with the United Way and key stakeholders to guide the development of this interim shelter recovery plan. Uh, the task force released its comprehensive report in September and supported the recommendations related to the city's 24 month strategy to create 3000 units of affordable and supportive housing. The implementation plan before you today is intended to guide the actions of SSHA over the next year and during the development of our next five year housing stability service plan. We had the support of the Toronto Alliance to End Homelessness, the Toronto Shelter Network, the Toronto Drop-In Network, Ontario Health Toronto Region, the Community Health Centre Network, Toronto Public Health and the Housing Secretariat, as well as a range of community partners and community representatives who all contributed their expertise and advice. We also had a separate parallel Indigenous strategy that was co-created with the Toronto Indigenous Community Advisory Board, which is in line with our meeting in the middle and reconciliation commitments. Next slide, please. The report identifies the actions that were implemented in the first phase. What was successful and what do we want to continue on in the coming months? These measures included maintaining physical distancing in the shelter system through expanding our, our facilities and so maintaining those, uh, those uh, programs. Exploring design options to further reduce the transmission of the virus. So as we've learned more about the virus, we're looking at the use of ventilation systems, impermeable barriers, uh, different ways that we can enhance infection and prevention and control measures. Uh, ensure that we have access to streamlined testing and continue proactive mobile testing in partnership uh, with TPH and our health partners. Maintaining mandatory masks for staff and clients in common areas. Um, we recently uh, implemented a directive uh, for clients. The staff have been wearing uh, masks for many months. Uh, we are also working with TPH and other healthcare providers to um, provide more proactive IPAC support to our many community partners. And we're continuing to enhance our strategies for outbreak management, including maintaining our isolation and recovery program. And ensuring that we continue to have the needed staff capacity 
to continue operating these extended, expanded facilities. Next slide, please. The task force identified the need to change the way we shelter people to provide COVID safe and dignified options. There has been a huge amount of change in the system over the last six months. And while it has been incredibly challenging, it also presents us with an opportunity to do things differently and to break those old comfortable habits. Next slide, please. First of all, I wanted to uh, provide an, a little bit of an update on the current situation uh, in our shelter system. So overall capacity in the shelter system has decreased since the beginning of the pandemic, but this is driven to a decline in the number of refugee claimants, primarily families in our shelter system as a result of the ongoing border closure. The number of refugees in our shelter system has decreased by more than 1,300 people between March and September. So as the demand for temporary refugee programs has decreased, those dedicated programs have either closed, been reduced, or converted for use for the overall COVID-19 response. And the bed capacity, while not the room capacity, of these programs understandably has reduced because as they transitioned from family programs to focusing on singles and couples, uh, the way that we count the beds changes because obviously when a family uses a room, it typically is used by three to four people as opposed to when it's used by a single or a couple, it's only counted as one or two. Next slide, please. So despite the changes in the family capacity, it is really important to note uh, the capacity in the single sector has been maintained throughout the pandemic. To achieve physical distancing in the shelter system, 2,300 spaces in the base system had to be moved out into temporary locations in just a few short months. Typically, the, sh the city elders opens one shelter a year for under 100 people. So I hope you can appreciate that this was a significant achievement and could not have been realized without the tremendous efforts of city staff from right across the corporation and also for, from our uh, community partners. So as you can see, capacity has been maintained and will again increase this coming winter. Uh, the chart, the last bar does include 240 winter spaces that will be opening uh, next month. It does not include the 220 additional spaces that will become available when people move out into the upcoming supportive housing uh, uh, opportunities, thereby freeing up their space for use by another client. Next slide, please. So uh, every year for the past five years, the city has expanded the number of additional spaces offered during the winter months, and we will continue to do so this year. In addition this year, though, we had to review everything we do through the lens of COVID-19. And so we have adjusted service models based on the current public health guidance to ensure that we continue to protect vulnerable individuals experiencing homelessness from both COVID-19 and the risks of exposure during the cold months. Our winter plan this year includes an additional 560 spaces as compared to 485 spaces last year. And the components of this year's plan includes additional respite space that we will be operating out of the Better Living Center at Exhibition Stadium, prioritizing people to move from shelters into new permanent supportive housing in order to free up uh, additional capacity in the shelter system, providing a replacement for the overnight out of the cold program um, by operating a program that's available 24 seven during the winter months activating uh, warming center locations in four locations this year, as opposed to only one location last year, and providing additional and ongoing 24 seven mobile outreach during extreme cold weather alerts to people who do remain outside during the winter. And in addition, we will continue to operate the 200 spaces that were opened as part of last year's winter season capacity, but that we did not close in the spring because of COVID-19. And as with our COVID response, it's important to note that our winter plan, it's adaptable and it's scalable 
and we will continue to evolve it as required in response to COVID-19 and the oncoming winter. Next slide, please. As one of the key actions identified by the task force, SSHA will continue to work with our inter interdivisional partners across the city and our community partners to review and enhance the city's approach and protocols to enhancements using a human rights and public health approach grounded in evidence-based practices that promote client and community safety. Streets to Homes and our outreach partners have helped uh, more than 850 people move from encampments into safe indoor spaces, and we've been able to clear more than 60 encampments. However, we continue to estimate there's about 400 people that remain outside living in encampments. We remain focused on the safety of those encampments and on helping people staying outdoors to move into indoor spaces, into shelter programs, hotel programs, and housing opportunities. Streets to Homes will continue to check on and work with people who do remain outside um, and will uh, distribute uh, sleeping bags and blankets during extreme cold weather. Next slide, please. So as we've moved uh, people into temporary shelter programs, especially as we've moved large numbers of people from encampments, it became very clear that additional supports were needed to ensure that the programs were successful and that we could meet the complex needs uh, of, those, uh, of those populations, including the increased impact of the opioid epidemic. The city and community health partners acted quickly to provide enhanced mental health case management and harm reduction services in new locations where they were urgently needed as an interim measure. Greater funding and partnership from other orders of government is needed to make additional longer term commitments to mental health and addiction services that is scalable across the broader shelter system. We continue to work actively with Toronto Public Health, with our harm reduction agency partners and with our health partners to build out the existing supports across the system. And there is excellent collaboration happening at these tables. We've also begun a community engagement process at several of our new locations where there have been concerns raised by the local community. We took urgent action during the early months of the pandemic in order to save lives, and we opened 40 new locations. But we also recognize that the need for speed had unintended consequences that we must now make sure we address. We cannot close or relocate programs. The demand is too great and the options are too limited. However, we are committed to ongoing engagement with communities to mitigate any issues that arise and to ensure the programs successfully integrate into the community while they are open. We have also initiated a third party review and an update of our current engagement approach and tools. There is clearly room for improvement and we are committed to doing what is needed to su support the successful integration of programs into their community. Next slide, please. There was one resounding theme that we heard from the task force and through our engagement process. And this was to focus on housing, permanent solutions to homelessness through the recovery and rebuild period. Next slide. So we are going to continue to increase efforts to move people from shelter into, into housing. We're gonna maintain our rapid housing initiative that was started back in March and that has successfully housed 318 people. In total, we have housed 2000 people, moved them into permanent housing since the beginning of the pandemic. And this is a 50% increase year over year. So not only have we significantly shifted the shelter system into multiple new locations, but we've also been working diligently on the more permanent solutions, creating those housing opportunities and helping people to achieve those. And this has significantly, significantly been helped by the ongoing implementation of our expanded coordinated access approach, which prioritizes and matches people experiencing homelessness with available housing opportunities and the necessary supports for them to be successful. 
Next slide. An annual shelter infrastructure plan is presented to council each year and provides a progress update and plans for the following year. As a result of the changes to shelter standards requiring two meters of distance between beds, all shelter locations are operating at reduced capacity and all planned new shelters opening in 2021 are currently being uh, assessed and readjusted to ensure that they comply with these interim shelter guidelines. But this has resulted in a 40 to 70% reduction in capacity in the currently planned shelters. The city's COVID response has also po postponed or delayed some of the construction on our new sites. Next slide, please. The housing TO plan previously identified that staff would explore opportunities to leverage existing shelter properties for development of supportive housing. So staff will undertake that review over the next few months, looking at our existing shelter opportunities and identifying two or three pilot projects that could be implemented within the next six to 12 months to convert these shelter sites into supportive long-term housing and identify the cost benefit uh, of this alternative service model. There are three additional sites that have yet to be developed in our thousand bed initiative. And there may be opportunities to convert the remaining unsecured uh, locations and seek locations that are better suited for housing. And if approved, the recommendations in this report will also allow us to pivot from the thousand bed shelter program towards housing, which would allow staff to consider uh, proposals like the shelter at 2950 and 2970 Lakeshore Boulevard to shift from a proposed shelter to a proposed supportive housing project. We have begun the preliminary investigations into the feasibility of locating permanent affordable supportive housing at the site. Uh, it's being conducted by a third party consultant. And if it's deemed feasible, uh, shelter support and housing will work with the housing secretariat to develop a proposal and report back to the planning and housing committee with the appropriate time at the appropriate time for further details on the implementation. Next slide. So while focus on creating housing opportunities to assist people exit the shelter system is a key part of our recovery, it is also critically important that we focus on preventing people from becoming homeless in the first place. We have heard very clearly that there are concerns about the uh, potential COVID-19 economic impacts contributing to housing instability in the coming months. In an effort to respond to anticipated increase in demand for rent back rent bank loans for rental arrears, the city has expanded our rent bank program, which provides one-time, no interest repayable loans to eligible low-income households. An additional investment of $2 million has been provided, um, along with critical program changes um, that respond to people's uh, economic situations. And this is predicted to support an additional 750 households in rental arrears with no interest loans of up to $4,000 to remain in their housing. And a report on the feasibility of expanding the Toronto Rent Bank Program and the Eviction Prevention and Community Program will be brought to Planning and Housing Committee in December. We've also had initial discussions with GTA Municipal Service Managers and there is uh, indication that there is strong interest to work together on shared solutions. And we are also initiating an intergovernmental working group that includes duty of care objectives and approaches to prevent homelessness. Next slide, please. COVID-19 has had a greater impact on those in the community who face greater health inequities including people experiencing homelessness and housing instability, women experiencing domestic violence, members of the LGBTQ2S community, and Black and Indigenous and people of color individuals. Next slide, please. We know that systemic racism contributes to discrimination, and there are unique challenges for Black people experiencing homelessness, and our services and our recovery needs to recognize and address these uh, because they, they continue to um, contribute 
to uh, anti-Black racism. And we need to confront those issues uh, and dismantle a uh, system of racism that has been uh, present for many years. We will also work with our Confronting Anti-Black Racism Unit and Black-led service providers to advance these recommendations identified through the recovery strategy and the engagement process. We will collect and act on data. We will center the voices of Black individuals, including service users and Black uh, leaders in the community. We will promote Black leadership, diversifying boards and executive staff in public service and community agencies to include more Black people in leadership positions. Recognizing the importance of shared experience in support, um, we will make sure we continue to think about how our surroundings uh, reflect our culture um, and expand, expand our uh, Black-led service providers to help us uh, implement these service, uh, new service solutions. Next slide, please. A separate and parallel Indigenous process and strategy was also co-created with the Indig Toronto Indigenous Community Advisory Board. And we will continue working with them closely on the implementation of these actions. These actions are consistent with our meeting in the middle strategy and the city's overall commitment to reconciliation. It identifies areas for action to meet the needs of Indigenous individuals experiencing homelessness by prioritizing Indigenous-focused housing solutions, expanding Indigenous-led outreach and supports, establishing a protocol to ensure Indigenous individuals who have moved into housing are connect connected with an Indigenous housing provider and support provider to make sure they continue to receive culturally appropriate support. Next slide, please. So in closing, the pandemic has magnified the issue of homelessness and the urgent need for permanent housing solutions to protect the health and well-being of this vulnerable population. This recovery strategy complements the City of Toronto's COVID-19 Housing and Homelessness Recovery Response Plan to create 3,000 permanent affordable homes within the next 24 months for vulnerable and marginalized residents. Staying the course and shifting investments into housing-focused projects will not be easy. And there will be pressure to continue to expand the shelter system as demand remains constant. However, the city has doubled the shelter capacity in the last five years, and we still operate at capacity every night. We have grown the safety net, but we have not created the pathways out. Ending chronic homelessness is possible, and it is a key part of the vision of Housing TO to achieve a well-functioning housing system where homelessness is prevented whenever possible. And when it does occur, the experience is rare, brief, and non-reoccurring. However, this is not a problem that you can solve alone. Solving homelessness cannot be done by a single organization or a single level of government. In the same way the pandemic highlighted the urgent need for enhanced coordination across systems to work together to protect people's lives from the virus, longer term solutions to end homelessness will also require leadership and collaboration across all orders of government, all sectors and all community stakeholders. We have to all row in the same direction. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation, Ms. Bernard. Ms. Bernard, we will be coming back to you, um, as I mentioned earlier, a little bit later. I will now um, turn our attention to um, speakers. We have a number of speakers on this item. In my list here, I've got about, I've got four names. And just before I call the first name of the speaker, uh, I just want to remind all the speakers that they will have five minutes to speak. And when you get to about the last 30 seconds of uh, your speaking, I will just let you know it's 30 seconds left. I will review that um, uh, comment again later on so it uh, 
confirms for everyone in terms of the uh, process and the amount of time that they actually have to speak. And, and members of committee, uh, you will have an opportunity to question um, Ms. Bedard at, um, at the conclusion of the uh, public uh, speaking on this item. The first um, speaker that I have to speak on the Shelter Recovery and Infrastructure Implementation Plan, and I hope I get his name, the name properly, it's um, uh, Vasit King, uh, New Toronto Ratepayers Association. Good morning, are you there? Yes, I am, thank you. Good morning, Ms. King. Thank you. And so, just before you, you begin, I just want to welcome you to the Economic and Community Development Committee meeting. Thank you for being here. And you have five minutes to speak. And as you get closer to the end of your time, with 30 seconds left, I'll inform you of the fact that you have 30 seconds. And at the conclusion of your remarks, members of committee may have questions for you, so I just want to ensure that you're available to respond to their questions if there are any. So, um, thank you again for being here. We appreciate you participating in this meeting. You now have five minutes to present your views on this particular report, EC 16.1. You may begin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, Vashti King from the New Toronto Rate Payers Association, I appreciate being here. And thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the many residents and business owners of New Toronto. On this call, you may hear from people who do not live in New Toronto and have no vested interest in our community, or from people who would rather put homeless people in emergency shelters than getting them into long-term affordable housing. That's not this group. 1,700 residents and business owners in this community have signed the attached petition opposing the shelter at this location. We strongly oppose the locations at 2950 and 2970 Lakeshore Boulevard West at our main commercial intersection in New Toronto for use as a shelter. We do not dispute, dispute the need for shelter beds in Ward 3 or anywhere else in the city, and we recognize the need to support marginalized and vulnerable populations in our city, especially during the pandemic. We're overwhelmingly united as a community in opposition of a shelter in the heart of New Toronto's small commercial strip. Since the site would not be available for at least two years, it would not serve people in need now. We urge the committee to reconsider the purchase of these properties and use these sites for ground floor commercial use and permanent affordable housing. Through the Freedom of Information Act, it's been discovered that the city is proposing to purchase the property for $13.8 million. This does not include a significant additional investment required to renovate these derelict 1950 commercial buildings. The current owner purchased the large office building in 2017 for $4 million and the combined assessed value is 5.3 million. We don't understand how the committee, the city can justify paying two to three times fair market value on top of paying a premium for commercial buildings at a main commercial intersection for temporary shelter housing, which in itself costs the city significantly more to operate than affordable permanent housing. Paying a premium to look at shelter at New Toronto's only commercial intersection will cripple local businesses already struggling pre-COVID-19, removing much needed long-term space from New Toronto's small commercial area and impacting jobs and local shopping opportunities. While most of the data you look at is at a ward level, you should know that the neighborhood of New Toronto is already three times the city's average density of social housing and rent geared to income units per capita. We shoulder 15.4% density per capita, three times the social housing density of Mimico, eight times the density of Long Branch, and 15 times the density of Alderwood the other neighborhoods in Ward 3. We're higher than Parkdale, higher than the Jane Finch Corridor, higher than Cabbage Town, St. James Town North. Layering a massive 100-bed shelter serving a transient population on top of the four existing shelters in our small neighborhood will overburden existing support services and segregate this need into one neighborhood within our ward. The City of Toronto Shelter Plan calls for smaller shelters integrated in communities. A 100-bed shelter at the only main commercial intersection in our small community of New Toronto is neither small nor integrated. In addition, the site selection criteria does not include a scan of other provincially supported shelters and programs that are already established in New Toronto. Locating a shelter on at 2950, 2970 Lakeshore Boulevard West uh, to serve a transient male population 
would be a direct safety and privacy concern with the women's habitat intake facility a mere 96 meters away and shares a back alley with that site, as would locating or co-locating a women's only shelter at a main commercial intersection, which would not provide the needed privacy and security. This simply is the wrong site for a shelter. It is a good site for commercial use and affordable housing. At best, shelters are a band-aid solution to homelessness. Affordable housing provides a durable, long-lasting solution to homelessness at a lower cost per person, which allows more clients to be helped for the same investment. We are encouraged to hear that the purchase of 2950, 2970 Lakeshore Boulevard West is being considered in the acquisition strategy for affordable housing, rather than from use as a shelter. And we support this change to affordable housing. People need to be moved out of the shelter system and into affordable supportive housing. While emergent responses to homelessness are critical to provide crisis support in the short term, these buildings will not be available for two years. <clears throat> Integrating a commercial aspect on the main floor to provide much needed job opportunities or supportive services. 30 seconds. Would provide, better, would provide better integration with the main commercial intersection and support residents to live successfully in the community. We are strongly opposed to the purchase of 2950 and 2970 Lakeshore Boulevard West and co-locating or locating a shelter on that site. We urge the city to provide, to find a more appropriate, less expensive site to locate a shelter in Ward 3. And if the city does close on this purchase of the buildings, we urge the city to retain commercial space on the ground floor for social services and to construct permanent affordable housing on the upper floors that would contribute to the long-term sustainable, community integrated and lasting solution to homelessness in the city of Toronto. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. King. Thank you. There are questions, all of you, so give me a moment. Um, Councillor Grimes to question. You have five minutes, Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, Basti. Thanks for um, your presentation this morning. And I think you answered all my questions in your um, in your deputation. So you would you you believe? I know you can't speak for everybody, but you you believe that your organization would support uh, the supportive housing on the site. Yes, I do. Um, I believe that people would be much more supportive of that, especially when the current owner had proposed um, to construct two floors of commercial space, tear down the buildings, construct two floors of commercial space and 95 rental units. Uh, the city had rejected that zoning application, but there was overwhelming support in our neighborhood to have rental apartments uh, at that site. Yeah, you were that was market rental, correct? You, you're aware of that? Say it again. You, that was that was market rental they were proposing there on that site, the developer? I believe it was, but it could have yeah. had an opportunity to be a, a joint effort with the city to make it affordable housing, but it was 95 yeah. rental units, which we needed. And just to be aware that the city did not reject the, uh, you were, they, they did not reject the zoning. It was uh, still before city planning. They, have, they appealed to T-Lab uh, because of the, the speed that the city was moving on, but it was not rejected by the city. Are you aware of that? Um, I'm aware of the report from um, from planning that does reject it. Uh, for height restrictions, citing a four-story height restriction, despite there being uh, three other buildings uh, that are uh, city-funded supportive housing that are eight-plus stories on Lakeshore in the same zoning area. Um, and so I do have that report uh, from planning that does reject that site for okay. site density as well as uh, height. Okay. Those are my questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Vashti. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Grimes. And I'm just looking, Ms. King, to see if there's any further questioners uh, for you. I see none. I'd like to thank you very much for participating in uh, today's um, committee meeting, and thank you for your comments. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving right along, our next uh, speaker is uh, uh, Kara Heineck, Toronto Alliance to End Homelessness. Ms. Heineck, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, good morning. Just before you begin, I will just can let you know that um, certainly to welcome you to our Economic and Community Development Committee meeting, and you have five minutes to speak. When you're getting closer to the end of the five minutes, at the 30 seconds left in your remarks, I will just let you know there's 30 seconds left. And members of the committee may ask you questions at the duration of your comments and your remarks. And I wish, again, to thank you very much for participating in this very important discussion on um, the Shelter Recovery and Infrastructure Plan. Thank you. You may begin. You have five minutes. 
Thank you very, very much, Chair and uh, Committee, for the opportunity to speak with you today on behalf of the TAH. Um, we are here to support item uh, EC 16.1, the Shelter Recovery and Infrastructure Implementation Plan. And as we noted at the Planning and Housing Committee last month when it was first tabled, we agree and I'm quoting from the uh, report, that the solution for individuals experiencing homelessness during a pandemic is the same solution they need to avoid and exit homelessness, safe housing that they can afford and that provides them with the support they need. So given that Toronto is moving into a winter period with climbing COVID-19 infections and the deeper vulnerabilities of people experiencing homelessness, a population already overrepresented with people experiencing other profound barriers to the social determinants of health, it is urgent that the following recommendations in this report be approved and acted on as quickly as possible. So in other words, these would be our priorities to pivot the remaining resources and opportunities in the existing plan to build a thousand new shelter beds to supportive housing. This is a game-changing shift that is needed, that is supported by the Alliance and our hundreds of partners across the city, and one which allows the city to maximize the value of new federal capital funds. It's encouraging here too, to see that staff are exploring and ready to pursue supportive housing options at the Lakeshore site and encouraging to hear the previous deputant uh, express support for this change as well. Two, to conduct a portfolio review of existing shelter assets to identify sites appropriate for conversion to supportive housing and to use existing shelter operating funding for housing supports at these sites. This is another big step forward and the Alliance is more than ready to work with the city and our colleagues with the Toronto Shelter Network to get this right. And regarding the city's positive move towards its own role in developing and funding supportive housing in Toronto, we trust that the TAH, as well as people with lived experience, will be closely involved. We bring experience from a variety of sectors and funders to the table and can coordinate community and agency collaboration as we have been doing with the modular housing initiative to date. Three, to increase the provincial role in making the shelter health services framework first developed with the Toronto area LINs in 2018, a true reality. And four, that we work with the province to end discharges into homelessness from provincial institutions such as hospitals and correction facilities. It is, uh, you can't overstate I think how important this is and that it is possible to ensure that everyone has a housing plan before leaving for example, a hospital or a jail. In addition to these explicit recommendations, we also welcome the following highlights in the report, the critical need to address inequality, racism and colonialism and how we plan and deliver services, the increased focus on prevention, the human rights-based approach to serving people in encampments and the new winter service plan, including its replacement of the migratory out of the cold system the same capacity running 24 seven at, and at consistent locations. It's a very good move. This report also speaks to areas we're looking forward to seeing and being part of being developed further. And key for us is increasing access to housing benefits for people experiencing homelessness. Ultimately, the Alliance envisions a response to homelessness where every person experiencing it has access to housing benefits. They work quickly and well for people who only need some income support to secure their own housing again. And we understand that opportunities exist with both advocacy to the other orders of government to make the Canada Ontario housing benefit more useful and to enhance Toronto's own housing allowance program, the THAP. We will advocate alongside the city as we always do and are doing right now for these additional housing benefit resources but we will also continue to encourage council to increase Toronto's own role in funding and using this tool. 30 seconds. As we experience... Okay, thank you. So then we also really, um, uh, there are other highlights that you can read in our deputation, uh, but the other piece I do wanna draw your attention to is the one omission in the report is uh, a plan on more focused strategies for particular populations and especially young people. 
We know that at least a third of people experiencing homelessness have their first encounter in their youth, with 63% of those sleeping rough having done so. It's an instructive statistic and tells us that if we address youth homelessness seriously, the differential strategy, we can end homelessness overall. Thank you. By stopping that inflow from people from youth okay. into adult homelessness. Thank, Thank, you, Thank you, very you very much. much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Let me just check to see whether or not there are any questions of you. Um, I see none. Thank you very much again for your presentation. Thank you. Right. Have a nice day. Uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Melissa Goldstein. Are you there, Melissa? Yes. Yes, good Bye. morning, and thank you very much for um, coming to speak uh, to the Economic and Community Development Committee. You have five minutes to speak at um, the uh, four minutes and 30 seconds, uh, Mark, I will inform you that uh, it's 30 seconds remaining. Um, at the conclusion of your remarks, members of the committee may ask you questions, so I just wanted to prepare you for that, but I think you're aware of that. You're no, I, don't, I think you've been at this committee before. Um, thank you very much and good morning. So you have five minutes, you may begin. Thank you for the opportunity to, opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Melissa Goldstein and I'm, I'm a concerned resident and a, an affordable housing and homelessness advocate. In September, I spoke at the Planning and Housing Committee meeting about the fact that the shelter recovery strategy didn't include a realistic plan to ensure that people in encampments survive the winter. And I outlined what I saw as the city's only three options. At the meeting, SSHA assured the committee that its winter service plan would be out shortly to address the issues that I'd raised. Well, now it's two weeks later and we have a winter service plan that still won't ensure that people in encampments survive the winter. Not only that, but there's no plan to avoid the massive humanitarian crisis that will result should the provincial government not intervene and stop the tens of thousands of Toronto tenants with rental arrears from being evicted. The winter service plan is premised on an estimate of the current population of homeless people, 350 to 400, that is far less than the 1,000 to 1,500 people estimated by people on the front lines. And it aims to accommodate the same additional number of people as SSHA plans to accommodate every winter, even though the situation this year is so much worse. The winter service plan always falls short each winter, and there's a mad scramble in the middle to find places for people to go after intense public pressure to keep people from dying. This status quo plan at a time when every park in the city seems to have people living in it, when there seems to be no space in shelters and respites for people to access, and people are being evicted from their homes on a daily basis is a disaster in the making. SSHA should at the very least be preparing for the possibility of the tsunami of residential evictions, but they are waiting until it happens to figure out what to do, which ensures that by the time anything is done to address the problem, it will be too little, too late, and people will be dead. People frozen to death, burned to death in fires trying to stay warm. Things we have sadly seen before in the city, but this time on a massive scale, and all the deaths wholly preventable. In addition to the plan being based on data that differs significantly from knowledge on the ground, it contains a version of facts about what, what SHA has staff have been doing and protocols that are being followed that differ significantly from what people on the ground are experiencing and documenting. The plan implies that there are hundreds of vacant spaces in the shelter system, yet when people call to access spaces, they're turned away. The plan talks about a COVID-19 response strategy for outreach at encampments undertaken by the city and community partners, yet we haven't seen any evidence of their efforts, including the delivery of water by streets to home staff. The plan details an encampment clearing protocol that respects people's human rights. However, there's considerable evidence that this protocol is not being followed, and it, or at least not consistently. The plan says that the city has an encampment operations working group that provides executive leadership and the operationalization of housing as a human rights principles with respect to encampment policy and planning. And yet the actions the city has taken to date with regards to encampment policy and planning are inconsistent with the human rights approach serving individuals in encampments and shelter spaces. Instead of being protected, people in encampments experience violence from those who should be tasked with protecting them. Shelter hotel residents complains about unsafe conditions and violence by staff goes ignored. Residents of encampments have not been engaged at all in participating in solutions to serve them. They're not treated as essential partners as the plan claims, but as blights to be cleaned up. Let me make it very clear. People will die unless a significantly better winter service plan is developed. We need a plan for what's needed, what's expected, and what may come. The fact that the city's response to the current pandemic uh, crisis is a winter plan that prepares to accommodate the same number of additional people is a huge problem when even in previous years, that number has proven inadequate. Given that the current situation is already much worse than in previous, previous years, 
It is clear that this target is wholly inadequate to address the realities of the present moment and must be dramatically increased. SSHA's lack of contingency planning basically guarantees that if the province doesn't restore the moratorium on evictions, there will be a massive expansion of homeless encampments across the city and a massive humanitarian crisis in the middle of winter. Even if a moratorium is reinstated, a plan to prevent evictions will still be required if tenants don't receive the rent relief or funds for their unpaid rent. While SSHA is prepared a plan that is limited to the funds they have available, they should have developed an evidence-based plan that adequately responds to the actual need and plans to address possible future scenarios, detailing the money and resources needed to implement these plans. Without this information, Council is unable to secure or allot the funds needed to adequately respond to the current homelessness situation and to address future emergencies because it's unclear 30 what seconds. response would be and how much it would cost. I, uh, in my submission, I outlined the three things that uh, the city needs to do immediately to ensure people survive the winter. Uh, quickly, it's uh, around a rent subsidy. It's around helping people live successfully in encampments and securing additional 2,000 hotel, shelter hotels as they did earlier. Um, in addition to those things, uh, sorry, uh, they need to prevent there being even more homelessness by ex immediately expanding and removing barriers to expanding eviction prevention, rent stabilization, and subsidy programs. Thank you. They're aiming to bring a report to the committee in December, and that's far too late. Okay. And we also need more warming centers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions for the speakers? Looking at members. Okay. See none. There are no speak. There's no questions for you, ma'am. Thank you very much. All right, moving right along, we have our next speaker is Ali Khan uh, Pobani. Hello. Hi, you there? Thank you. Um, yeah. Just wanted to welcome you to um, the meeting, um, uh, the meeting, the Economic uh, and Community Development Committee meeting. You have five minutes to speak. When you get to the four minutes and 30 second mark, I will let you know that you've got 30 seconds less left. Um, and at the end of your remarks, members of committee may have questions of you. So welcome to, uh, to the Economic and Community Development uh, Committee meeting, and you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Hello, my, na oh. Hello, my name is Ali Khan Kobani, and I'm a dedicated musician and longtime tenant in Parkdale. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I care deeply about my neighbors and try in earnest to support the struggles of those less privileged than me. When the pandemic hit, the nature of these struggles became even more acute, and as a result, an ad hoc group of unpaid community members called the Encampment Support Network was formed, of which I'm a part. We have spent the last four odd months delivering basic humanitarian aid to 12 encampments to fill a void left by the city. We are not doing this work to advance ourselves or our careers, as many of us are artists, whose very sense of purpose has been put on hold. Nor am I here to defend my peers who share my class position, as some have and will demonstrate today. We do not want to have to exist at all, and in fact take this question so seriously that we vote periodically on whether to disband. While any sort of recognition is not why we operate, we understand why, to date, the words encampment support network have not escaped the lips of any city councillor or official. An acknowledgement of our existence would constitute a tacit admission of the city's neglect. In this six-page winter service plan, the term harm reduction appears 12 times. I'm heartened to see the need to reduce harm front and center in the document and would like to offer feedback on ways this can be accomplished more effectively. First, the city must cease encampment evictions immediately. The document states, quote, before an encampment is cleared by a city division responsible for enforcement, outreach workers attend the site to offer options of interim or permanent housing, motels or hotels, shelter or respite spaces to individuals to access shelter and support. If an encampment is vacated by individuals choosing to access shelter or housing or to relocate, the site is cleaned by city staff, end quote. This is not what we have been seeing and documenting on the ground. I have been forced to console elder, I have been forced to console elderly residents as they beg in tears for parks ambassadors to allow them to collect their meager belongings, including their phone, ID, and winter clothing, to no avail before their homes are callously tossed into a dump truck. This has to stop. Even if encampment residents have refused alternative offers, which in many instances is not even the case, as they have merely left their tent momentarily to conduct daily affairs, they should be allowed the dignity of choosing to stay where they are. 
there are many good reasons why they might make this choice. Leaving aside the justifiable concerns around the scientifically demonstrable COVID risks in congregate settings and the strict curfews in place, which, if broken, come with the penalty of eviction back onto the streets and, frankly, cruel disposal of one's belongings, such as tents, sleeping bags, and winter clothing, some houseless people suffer from addiction challenges. The document states, quote, the city and our community health partners have acted quickly to provide enhanced mental health case management and harm reduction services in new shelter locations where they are urgently needed as an interim measure, end quote. In many shelters, one also risks immediate eviction if caught, if caught using on the premises. This forces people to use elsewhere, attracting the ire of NIMBY groups and leaves them susceptible, susceptible to police violence and criminalization. The document also states that, quote, streets to homes Outreach teams provide water to individuals in encampments and, and as well as health and harm reduction supplies, end quote. We have documented violent drug raids in the dead of night on encampments by the TPS, who also sit on the city's encampment operations working group, as well as the steering committee for the city's response to encampments. The same teams, which include the city divisions tasked with distributing harm reduction supplies to drug users. This contradictory alliance, in my view, is a grotesque breach of privacy and amounts to entrapment. The city boasts that it, quote, has moved more than 850 people from encampments into safe indoor spaces, end quote, and warns about a, quote, misperception that living outdoors is a safer alternative to staying in a congregate setting, end quote. However, the, 800 figure, the 850 figure conveniently includes the significant volume of people who have since voluntarily left the so-called safe indoor spaces provided by the city to return to living outdoors for myriad reasons, including those I listed earlier. The document estimates that there are between 350 to 400 people living in tents and have planned accordingly. Our numbers show that this is a gross underestimation, presumably intended to conceal the fact that the plan falls way short of ensuring no one will freeze to death in the coming months. 30 seconds. At a, plan at a planning and housing committee meeting a few weeks ago, after hearing many meticulously crafted arguments exposing the lack of urgency in the city's housing strategy, a counselor intimated that their desire, a counselor intimated their desire to see us come together as Torontonians to make demands of the provincial and federal governments as a united front. It is my contention that in order to do this, we must first all be on the same page. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just looking to see if there are any questions of you. Uh, I see none. Thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, members, um, we're now going to ask Ms. Uh, Bedard to come back and uh, prepare for questioning. Uh, the first question that I have is, is Councillor Grimes. Councillor Grimes, you'll have five minutes. I wonder if we can reset the clock, please. Okay, thank you. Councillor Grimes, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, yeah, question to our GM. Um, Marianne, at the top of your presentation today, you mentioned uh, the Better Living Centre and Exhibition Stadium. I think you mean Exhibition Place, correct? Mayor, that is correct, Councillor. Thank you for that correction. <laughs> you said stadium. I want to fire people up at the stadium. So, um, so I want to talk about 2950, 2970, and, and, and I guess the rest. So, recommendation number four and five is going to allow you to take the money that has been earmarked for shelters to look to go to our supportive housing, correct? That's number four and five are gonna help you to redirect some of those monies to go to the, the um, supportive housing, correct? That's correct, Councillor. At the moment, uh, city staff are only authorized to use that money for the creation of emergency shelter. Uh, and this, uh, these recommendations are, are asking for a bit of a broader interpretation to allow us to consider permanent housing solutions. Great. So with regards to 2950 and 2900 Lakeshore Boulevard, uh, we're kind of in a different process. We're kind of ahead, really ahead of the consultation that would normally take place. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, uh, Councillor. Uh, typically, uh, the process has uh, the city securing a site that meets the zoning requirements for a municipal shelter um, and then engaging with the community uh, about six to nine months prior to opening about the successful integration uh, into the community. Uh, and typically that includes uh, community space in our new shelters and how the community would like that community space used. Great. Um, so with regards to, uh, there's been talk out there about the city, the, the city has purchased, like council has approved the purchase of this site to be clear, correct? It just hasn't closed yet, but 
There's no vote on on this. Council's already approved the funding to uh, to purchase 29.50 20. Correct. That's correct. We're in what's called the due diligence period, which is the period of time that gives the city the opportunity to to review the contract. But uh, the purchase is uh, has been approved, and we are moving forward with that. Great. I know this. Uh, we don't can't talk about <clears throat> the price that was paid for it. It's still confidential, but there's numbers being thrown up by one of our uh, one of our deputy state are throwing a number out there. <clears throat> Could you explain the process when the city does uh, your division purchases a property? Um, that it's fair market. Could you maybe explain the process to be clear? Um, so, uh, Councillor, just to make sure that uh, because it's actually not shelter support and housing that does that uh, piece of work, it's uh, our uh, CREM uh, area, and I believe Pat Matozo is on the line, and he'd be much more able to answer those questions. Great. I'll, uh, come, back. I'll, I'll come back back to Pat in a second. Okay. Um, okay. But I, I did like recommendation number nine, as we have the mineral correctional facility. So, what is the current practice now um, that the province has when? Discharging someone from a prison or, or, or a hospital. What is the current practice? Now? They, just, they walk out with uh, no plan at all. Um, it's it's mixed, counselor. To tell you the truth, uh, sometimes uh, some hospitals, some uh, correctional facilities will call our central intake line to to find out where somebody could access a shelter bed. Um, but more often than not, uh, they are simply discharged. Yeah. And in your in your deputation, I heard you know we've doubled the capacity in the last five years. Uh, wh how do we why do we see that? And we, I know we've talked about this before, but the women, the woman that came from Brampton, they put her in a cab or sent her to Toronto. But what do we see? The the is why are we doubling our capacity in the last five years in your mind? Uh, well, you know, there was a large amount of pressure on our system due to uh, refugee asylum claimants coming into the city, um, but also just the, you know, uh, <clears throat> typical local shelter user has has also increased. Um, I do think that the lack of a regional plan uh, has contributed. Toronto has a much more comprehensive um, shelter and uh, support network. Um, than many of our regional partners, and people will travel to secure the necessities uh, of life. Great. And on that note, you have in 2019 draft in the province about looking at other shelters. And I just talked to the Premier about it yesterday about looking at Hamilton and Mississauga and Whitby and Oshawa and Barrie to build shelters, just not only in Toronto. How are those talks going? I know it's a crazy time right now. Have they progressed or are they still on the books? Um, we, we continue conversations uh, at the staff level um, and also with our regional partners. As I mentioned, part of the report was to, uh, to, you know, to convene a regional table and begin some of those discussions about how we can make sure <clears throat> that we're supporting one another in our approaches. Thank great. you very much, Councillor Grimes. Okay, well, uh, Councillor Grimes, Councillor Grimes, Councillor yeah. Grimes, I'll let Mr. Matuzo answer your question because you did pose it, but your time is up. And Mr. Chair, I just want to recognize Mary Bedard and her division, the great work to do. I understand the tremendous amount of pressure. Councillor Grimes, you can you speak. You can speak yeah. on the issue. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Good morning to you, Mr. Chair, to you, uh, Councillor Grimes. So uh, generally, with acquisitions, we'll work with SSHA and a broker to find a, a suitable site. Um, we'll analyze the site based on size, location, zoning, and of course, meeting the program requirements. So, and of course, asking price. So, once we've you know narrowed it down to a short <laughs> list of sites or a specific site, we'll engage with uh, a professional appraiser and use our own uh, appraisal staff to determine what a what a fair market value is and use that as part of our negotiations. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leanings. Please, thank you. Thank you very much, Councilor Grimes. Thank you. Um, our next questionnaire is Councillor Carroll. Councillor Carroll, you have five minutes. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's just a question uh, based on one of the deputants was asking us about the winter plant specifically. And uh, I know we were sent a briefing note uh, uh, to accompany this report that really sort of pulls out of the, the whole interim strategy, the, the pieces that, that impact our ability to serve in the winter and and highlights additional beds but the the definite made made uh reference to the fact that you'd be reporting to us on De in december on that is there a reason why we couldn't be hearing about that earlier given that 
that what is considered the winter season really starts for tenants and, and indeed people in, in living in homelessness situations starts November 15th? Uh, uh, to, to the chair, I'm I'm not sure what uh, the deputant was referring to. This this is at the winter plan. We we are not uh, coming back to council in December. Um, I believe we are coming back to council in December uh, with the housing secretariat as a. Uh, request from the uh, Housing and Tenant Subcommittee about access to eviction prevention supports, uh, but not in terms of the winter plan. Okay, so so basically, it's what we can do is in here, but things like like uh, uh, opening the better better living center if we need them, the additional warming centers, things like that, actually do. Well, it's not ideal. It, it's it's uh, as far as we can go with our funding. There are some some additions to our ability to respond uh, in the winter this year. Absolutely, uh, Councillor. And as I mentioned in in my presentation, uh, we're putting forward what we what we feel currently is is the is a plan to meet the demand. Um, but this plan is uh, scalable um, and it is uh, nimble enough to respond to anything new that we learn uh, about the virus uh, increases in in pressure. Um, and uh, and so we do have those uh, additional options that we could exercise. Um, of, co of course, as the as a deputy also noted, this uh, we are significantly uh, over budget. Uh, by the end of the year, we anticipate shelter support and housing will have spent 165 million dollars more than our budget, um, and so these are very difficult um, things for city council to to grapple with. Yeah. But we have yeah. we have options uh, available to us. Okay, and last question, Mr. Chair. So, when you say scalable, uh, between the the state of emergency permissions and permissions that council has given in the past, you know, scaling up using extraordinary locations like the Better Living Center and so on and so forth, you've got the permissions you need. So, if you if you need to scale up, you can on pretty short notice. Uh, yes, I, I can't remember which uh, recommendation that was, but there was a, a recommendation there to uh, to support staff to to do that. Fantastic. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Carroll. And I'm just looking at the screen to see if there is any other members who wish to question. Um, can't see any at the moment. I, I do, uh, Chair. It's Councillor. Oh, I see, Councillor Cressy. Councillor Cressy. And Councillor Ford, do you have <clears throat> questions as well? Councillor Cressy, you may begin. You have five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair. A few questions. Uh, Mary Ann, uh, in your presentation, and I noticed in, in page 15 of the report, it talks about the city providing mental health case management and harm reduction services in some new locations. So I, I wonder if you could clarify two things for me. One, um, is that how... I, I, those are both provincial services. So are we spending money on that in the absence of provincial spending? Or is this a flow through arrangement? That I guess that's the first question on that. Uh, so, Councillor, uh, you are right. We are spending city dollars on services that are within the provincial jurisdiction. Um, and we are having those conversations with the province. But we didn't, uh, we didn't feel that we could uh, wait um, and uh, and see how those discussions uh, go. Okay. Now, it's now it's noted that we have those services, and so that helpful for the clarity in terms of the funding arrangement on that. Given that we're stepping in in the absence of, of supports from above, um, how, but these services are not available in all new shelter locations. Is that correct? They're only available in some. Uh, that that's correct, Councillor. Um, and and I should I should mention that we do have the flexibility to use some of the provincial uh, social service relief uh, fund money uh, to fund those services. Um, the the question is though that uh, those are housing dollars meant to be for housing solutions, um, and so we are using them, in fact, for healthcare solutions, and, and that should be a separate funding source. But it is only uh, right now available in uh, limited locations, some of our larger new uh, temporary hotel locations. 
And but is it correct that our your objective is, and I'm looking at recommendation six here, is to ensure that there's appropriate primary health care harm reduction and mental health services and overdose prevention services where across the system, not in only a select number of new ones. Is that right? That is right, uh, Councillor. And this was part of our new shelter model that was introduced when with a thousand bed um, was that not only would we build uh, new shelters that promoted dignity and, and privacy, but that we would wrap a program around that ensured better outcomes. And a significant portion of that was the required health supports that needed to be delivered um, on site in all locations to ensure those outcomes. Okay. And then on my second question, just picking up on where Councillor Carroll was, this is the question of if demand war, if the demand for services outstrips our supply, um, our capacity, your capacity to scale up the system, be it with permanent housing options or as part of a, a, an indoor shelter and respite response. I just want to understand in your recommendations where you have that authorization to ensure that you're covered. Is that what recommendation two is? This is uh, a re city council approve the plan and authorize the GM to enter into new or amend existing agreements as required to open and operate in the shelter infrastructure plan. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. And and so and is that is it clear uh, that that is to ensure that we meet the physical distancing requirements from TPH? Uh, that is correct, Councillor. We we want to maintain that in all of our new locations. Okay. I, I might have, and I know I spoke with you earlier, a slight amendment to that to clarify that this is to ensure that we can continue to meet um, as part of if we need to on a to expand an expansion to meet those requirements. I guess my last question here, uh, Chair, if I have time, is in the report you speak to um, with respect to, to encampments both rehousing and indoor accommodation efforts, as well as the provision of essential supports uh, as part of the city's response. What, what do we, what essential supports are provided? Uh, I'm sorry, Councillor, my audio went off at the beginning of your, of your question. Oh, sorry. So this was specifically an encampment. So you spoke to in the presentation and in the report that the, a two-pronged approach here. One is working towards rehousing and safe indoor accommodations and the second was the provision of essential supports in the meantime i was wondering if you what could you define what essential supports are what do we mean what do, what do you mean by that absolutely uh, councillor so currently uh, streets to homes uh, visits uh, encampment sites uh, they have been providing water they ha also have been providing uh, harm reduction supports, uh, naloxone, um, and as we head into the to the winter months, uh, adding to that uh, blankets uh, and sleeping bags. We have also, with our interdivisional uh, partners, been uh, attending sites where there are concerns around uh, hazards or a large amount of debris. Uh, we have been going in and offering to clean the sites um, to to make them uh, uh, safer for the people who stay there. Thank you. Thank questions. you. Thank, thank you. Chair. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Cressy. I'm just seeing if any other members have uh, questions. Councillor Ford, do you have Chair. questions? Mr. Chair. Councillor Ford, do you have questions? Sorry. Sorry, Councillor Kelly. It's Councillor Carroll. One moment, please. Councillor Ford, do you have questions? Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, I, I do have a couple and I could be brief. No, that's fine. I just didn't have your name and I didn't see an indication that you had any questions. If you could maybe just let the clerk know. Um, and just before you begin, I'll just um, uh, go to Councillor Carroll. Councillor Carroll, did you have a point of order? Uh, well, not a point of order. I was just wondering if there's a second round. I have just a, uh, I have a, a one question that I forgot to ask, sure. which is of a financial nature. Okay, Thanks. fair enough. Um, sure enough, Councillor Carroll. I'll offer members a second round if you should so desire. Um, okay, so Councillor Ford, we're turning to you now. You have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and thank you very much, Marianne, uh, for the report you put forward and, of course, meeting with me the other day or, or your staff to go over it um, has answered a lot of questions. But just a couple more coming out of, I think, a few uh, deputants' questions that I'd like to get 
uh, clear. So I think the first one is around demand of the system, uh, pre and co no, we aren't post COVID, uh, pre and during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so what was our shelter demand going into COVID and what is it currently? Uh, so, Councillor, uh, if you think back to the to the presentation, um, mm -hmm. one of the slides showed the overall capacity in the shelter system um, has reduced uh, by about a thousand spaces, but that was completely uh, connected to the reduction of the number of families uh, that we have in our shelter system, uh, specifically refugee families. Uh, those are, are counted uh, as three to four people as opposed to singles. Um, so that does have an impact on the number of beds, which is why I made sure that we showed the single sector uh, separated away from the uh, family sector to clearly show that the capacity of our single sector has remained consistent. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and yes, yeah, so I, I did say, I think it was on page five or six of the presentation. Um, so going into the winter, of course, this is always a, uh, you know, a, a very sensitive time for people experiencing homelessness in our city. Um, so, so with the plan is right now going into the winter months, you said, I think in your presentation that 240 space, or was it 560 spaces open up? That's correct, Councillor. 560. 560. Right. And what do you what what do we see as being usually in years past the demand in the winter months, whether it's by percentage or whatnot? Mm -hmm. What 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 does that increase look like on the shelter system? Um, well, councillors, as I said, we've provided winter beds every winter for five years, um, and every year that number has uh, increased, and, and uh, we started out at 100, um, and now we're up to 560 spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, we we do know, uh, based on uh, an audit that our Streets to Homes uh, team does uh, and regularly redoes, that we have about uh, 400 tents um, up in, uh, in encampments across the city. And so that's how we, um, you know, draw an estimate of the, of the number of people that remain uh, outside. Uh, and typically those are the people that we focus um, access for our winter services on people who are currently not sheltered, who we want to make sure have an option to come in uh, when it's cold. Now, now in the winter months, um, now, now this conversation has come up, I, I think, every, every fall going into winter that I've been on council. Um, but it's, it's around um, the, the notion of uh, people being turned away if they need a shelter. Um, and I know the city does everything in their power to do to not do that um, and and whatnot. So um, particularly, um, we do everything we can to make sure people get a place in the shelter system or any which way we can if they need it. Correct. Um, we, we do, Councillor. You know, we work really hard to make capacity available to ensure that our central intake line is, is staffed and available uh, when people call in for shelter beds. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a dynamic uh, system and, uh, you know, we, although we try to make sure that there is always space, um, I cannot mm -hmm. guarantee that we will always have an available space when somebody uh, calls uh, to get one. Um, but we do continue to uh, connect with people who are, you know, waiting for a shelter bed. Um, these are some of the reasons, um, you know, why we want to make sure that the program is nimble and scalable if that becomes a significant uh, issue, but we do work very hard to try to maintain that commitment. Okay, and then um, my, my last question, if I have time, um, is just around the rent bank. Um, that's going to be coming to committee in, in December, is that correct? Uh, yes, there is has been a request for a report on, on how mm -hmm. we might uh, augment or change it. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Ford. All right, so let me ask a few questions and I will get through to a second round as Councillor Carroll has asked. And um, so we will do that. Um, through you, um, Ms. Bernard, um, when you decide to use um, the hotel facilities, 
um, as a resource for shelter. What is the process in terms of communicating with the community in the surrounding areas where you are using the hotel's facilities? And can you also talk to me or talk to us about how you provide measures for safety and security? These are concerns that have been raised by a number of residents who have reached out to me. Uh, thank you for the question, Deputy Mayor. Um, uh, as uh, you know, the process to open up the temporary COVID response uh, hotels uh, has been different from our uh, process to site uh, shelter programs. Um, and that was primarily due to the rapid nature of our response. Um, we had to secure sites and open them, uh, you know, incredibly quickly. Um, most of the support staff that would typically do the engagement um, connections with the community were actually redeployed uh, out to the front line. And so we, we actually didn't have the, the physical bodies to do that. Um, what we tried to make sure that we did uh, in the meantime was communicate the information uh, to councillors so that um, they would have that information uh, should they choose to share it or if, if uh, constituents uh, had, had questions. Um, now that we have some of our staff back from the front lines, uh, we are enga engaging more formally in some of those engagement processes. So we are connecting with communities, we're establishing community liaison committees, um, we're working with BIA and residents associations, um, you know, and, and steps like that, which is much more of our typical, uh, our typical process. Um, in, terms of, in terms of safety, uh, we, again, uh, we connect with the local police division um, and monitor with them any increased activity that they might uh, report. Um, at our new temporary sites, again, we've, uh, we've initiated a new program called the Community Safety Team. This is a hired third party um, specialists that have uh, social service backgrounds, but also uh, training uh, around security. Uh, and they are out in the community. They are collecting any um, discarded drug paraphernalia. They're engaging with shelter clients. They're uh, ensuring that people are uh, abiding by local rules um, and helping to uh, respond to any community complaints. Thank you. Um, looking at page three of the report, and it talks about all the additional costs that the city has had to absorb as a result of um, physical distancing measures and so on. It also talks about the, so it's $83 million and in, there's a projected cost of um, $169.2 million at the end of uh, 2020. In terms of the federal and provincial contributions to that, what portion have they contributed? And another part of my question, because just to be sure that you've got all the information, what is the total budget that you are spending with respect to providing shelter and also as it relates to this plan that you have brought forward um, today? Uh, so, uh, yes, we, we anticipate by the end of the year that the response that we've mounted will cost about $169 million. Um, if we annualize that into next year, um, then it is closer to sort of $220 million to maintain uh, what we have, and that's over and above our typical uh, shelter, shelter budget. Um, we have received support from the federal and provincial government. Um, I, we've received uh, about $59 million uh, in the first half of the uh, pandemic response. Uh, we've recently put in a business case to the province to receive some additional social service relief fund um, dollars, and, and we're hoping that we uh, receive our full allocation, which has indicated it's about $118 million. Um, we are going to need to uh, use all of that money uh, towards these incredibly high um, operating costs. So, um, you know, we are uh, waiting to hear about the national housing strategy money as a, an option for us to, to use it for capital um, in order to secure some more permanent housing solutions. But the operational costs are significant and, and they're ongoing. Um, so we will be using the federal and provincial money for that. The, the issue that um, I worry about, but I'm sure my CFO uh, worries about much more, is that that money is only uh, committed until March the 31st. 
uh, and we have had no uh, discussions or indication that there would be funding uh, beyond that at this point, although we do continue to have good discussions at the provincial and federal level. Thank you very much. Uh, members, um, we will now afford a second round of questioning, and I will start with Councillor Carroll first. Councillor Carroll, you have five minutes. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, because it's perfect timing, because I want to really just follow the, uh, the, the line of questioning that you were on. I'm having trouble um, figuring out who and where the money's coming from. The, 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 the financial impact statement in the report talks about, it says the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing on August 14th announced an additional allocation of 118 million in funding for Toronto through the Social Services Relief Fund. But I noticed just now uh, you framed it in the same way. I noticed that when I was talking to staff preparing for this leading up to the committee, and now I've just heard you say the same, we've put in a business case. Does that mean we don't, we're not checking hand on the 118 million from the provincial government? Uh, we are not check in hand uh, at this uh, time. Um, all, all municipalities were asked to put in a business case of how they would use that uh, that funding, and it's now back with the province for for approval. Um, but again, we're we we're, we are having good conversations, and I am I am confident that they will approve that business case. Okay. And they announced that it's for Toronto pending a business case, or or that we could. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yes, it was pending approval of our business case. Okay. So, so that that's possible, and that's provincial money, or are they flowing through federal money to to be able to give us that? They are flowing through uh, federal money. Okay. And then, and then there is this extra on top of that. Then there is the federal government announcing an additional 236 million in natural in national funding through reaching home so is that money that will flow directly to municipalities there was a, a small allocation uh, through reaching home for operating money so again that's uh, in the region uh, and don't quote me, uh, 20 to $25 million. Um, but also there would be a, a large segment of that that is for uh, one-time capital costs, which is where we're hoping to uh, use some of that money to implement the plan that's before you today. We don't have an exact amount on that at the moment. Okay. But is it fair to say, and this is the most important thing, I think, really, is it fair to say that with respect to this, because we have the most dire problem with this, particularly while the uh, the uh, uh, pandemic is in in full swing and resurgence, but but really, really, it's our ongoing problem in the last uh, few winters. Is it fair to say that because Toronto's scale is unique, do we have a place at the table? Are they sort of checking in with us first to see what we need in the the major cities? and then designing their, their funding strategies from there? Or are we really just sort of in the queue with everyone? Um, so I would say that there are ongoing discussions, uh, both at the federal and, and provincial level. Um, you know, typically, you know, they, they are reaching out and asking us, you know, where are the pressures? What are the things that you're experiencing? Um, and then, uh, and then they develop their funding programs. So I do feel like the, the programs that they, uh, have, uh, designed are responsive to the issues that we're having in Toronto. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Carroll. I'm just looking to see whether or not there are any additional questioning questioners. Okay, seeing none, I have just a couple. Um, Mr. Bedard, you spoke about um, warming centers. You mentioned that there were four. Um, can you tell us where those are and are there any in Scarborough? Um, Councillor, we are currently confirming a location in Scarborough. We did feel it was important this year to make sure that there was a, a warming centre available uh, for people in Scarborough. So I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping that by the end of the week that we will uh, have confirmation on that site. Okay, thank you. Um, and where are the four locations that you have mentioned? 
So we are uh, planning on one in, um, in Scarborough, as I mentioned. We're also planning on uh, one in North Toronto and then two in the downtown um, area. So will this be the first time there will be one in Scarborough? It is. Hello, it'll Marguerite. Actually, it'll actually be the first time that there is... Yes, uh, I can. Who's this? Oh, I wonder hey, if you Paul. can mute your uh, microphone, please. Uh, There's somebody speaking. Marguerite, I believe that you, does you... Marguerite. Yeah, okay, thank you. You've muted. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> okay, go ahead, please. Sorry, sir. Councillor. Yes, so in, in previous years, uh, we've had a single... A warming center that opens up during extreme cold weather alerts that has been at Metro Hall uh, and we've done that for uh, the last uh, three years. So this year uh, will be the first year that we have more than uh, one location uh, available. All right. In recommendation seven of the report, you talk about the request of the federal and provincial government to work with the city prior to reopening borders and so on. Mm -hmm. You talked uh, earlier on to the questioning that uh, came regarding a regional approach in terms of addressing this issue and because it seems that everyone seemed to want to gravitate and come to Toronto. What exactly are you um, hoping to achieve with respect to the federal government and this approach? Because the approach has been attempted before, as I understand it, and what will be different this time around? Um, well, I think, you know, uh, in terms of recommendation number seven, which is specific to the reopening of the borders, mm -hmm. uh, what we experienced over the last three years uh, was a significant influx of uh, asylum claimants that, that Toronto acted very quickly and responsibly and, and expanded our shelter system. But then our, our commitments of support uh, followed after that. Um, and uh, again, even the uh, 2020 money um, that we had re have requested of the federal government, uh, we're still waiting to, to receive that. So what we're, what we're trying to say is, as opposed to playing catch up um, and having the city provide these um, uh, solutions up front, that we would, we would be interested in having that agreement uh, ahead of time. So with that we had a clear understanding of the costs that the federal government would be uh, covering and so that we could make sure we take that into consideration as we develop our services. Okay, thank you very much, fantastic. Um, okay, so we are now going to be moving to speakers. I see no further uh, questions of staff. All right, um, so uh, the first speaker I have is Councillor Grimes, followed by Councillor Carroll and Councillor Cressy, in that order. Thank you. Councillor Grimes, you may begin. You have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm happy to move the staff recommendations. I do want to thank Marianne and her team again. Uh, um, the, the shelter 29 Boulevard 2970, tensions issue in my I've had people uh, being for and against. We've had petitions, but I think this report here, uh, moving some of this money from uh, the shelter aspect of, to look at uh, Current housing solutions. I moved that motion back in July of 2019, and I want to thank Mary and her team for entertaining that. Although nothing's been decided yet, um, we are out in front of this. We've had uh, early consultation, Mary Ann said. That hasn't happened before, so I know it's uh, a hotbed of contention in the community, but I think this may bring um, both sides together. And I think we heard the deputy uh, today, Vashti King, from the Lakeshore ratepayers uh, say they she would support this. And I think uh, her membership will support that. So, although nothing's been decided yet, I think it's uh, a, a, a good recommendation here before us. I'm happy to move those. And again, it's good to hear that the provincial and federal governments have seen to be good talks, as Marianne said, going on uh, with the federal and provincial partners, which is um, which is great to hear. So, with that, I'll be short and just uh, happy to move the staff recommendation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Grimes. Our next uh, speaker is Councillor Carroll. Councillor Carroll, you have five minutes. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and it, I'd like to start by 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 thanking the previous speaker, by by thanking my fellow member, Councillor Grimes, because uh, I can tell from reading the communications that that he's had a, a difficult time of it in in uh, uh, working with the community about the the site in Lakeshore. It's never easy, and and so uh, um, highlighting for people that. That these are our are, are measures we take 
all the while trying to improve the actual housing situation is, is so important so that we can give people that assurance as we go forward. Um, I, I only wanted to speak because I, I hope that people might take the time to read this, whether, whether they have someone in their life who's experiencing homelessness or not, because this, uh, this report and the collaborative report that's attached uh, that, that the city uh, uh, collaborated with the United Way on really paints a picture that tells us that we're really only surviving the, the pandemic right now and its impact on the shelter and the housing system uh, because of the, the fact that, that the flow of refugees has, has slowed, the, the immigration uh, uh, traffic has slowed as people are staying in place uh, during the pandemic, which you know gave us about 800 beds of breathing room. That's not going to be the case forever. And so as fast as we can build housing, we still have a challenge in our shelter system. And we are going to need the governance, the, the, the other orders of government's assurance that they're there with us. And that as they open those, those uh, doors back up, that they have a plan as well as we have a plan. And it's why I asked the the uh, director of uh, SSHA in particular, do we have a place at the table? Because I don't think anyone is experiencing this on the scale that we are. And, and so uh, us actually being at the table, not just asking money and sending a business case, but they should want us at the table to help them figure out how best to deal with this and how best to develop a housing strategy. We still have a federal government technically doesn't really have a minister of housing. Um, uh, we have the, the the minister of family and social development handling the key pieces, but this is a key, key issue. And, and Toronto can be a driver in this, but it's certainly starting to play out across the country. And so I hope they read the report more than anything. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to speak to the winter plan because that is the thing we're hearing the most about is people are very, very concerned about the winter because pre-pandemic, we had a very difficult time with this last year. And uh, you never know when that cold snap is gonna come. It can be as early as in November. And so the stress that's gonna create is, uh, is, is important to keep in mind. But I do wanna end by, by thanking staff for everything they've done so far. I think we have to, in the middle of being concerned about what more can be done, we have to stop and, and actually salute this particular group of staff. Because as we went into this outbreak, uh, anyone in the healthcare system who was seeing those experiencing homelessness arrive at emergency wards, arrive at testing centers as soon as they were open, really thought, that we were going to see frightening amounts of mortality in that population. And the quick action and all the things we've done so far have, have staved that off to, to uh, a degree that, that no one could have predicted at those times. And so as much as we need to do much, much more and be much more ready for the winter, we have to stop and, and, and really look at, at how we did, in fact, see this staff make it through March, April, and May getting us to this point. I can only hope that the measures we're taking now and the funding that's coming, making us even more nimble might help us through this resurgence and, and I dare say second wave. Those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Carroll. Councillor Cressy to speak. You have five minutes, Councillor. Uh, well, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll begin by, by placing an emotion um, that has- Councillor Cressy, can I just ask you to hold for a second, please? I wonder if we could start the clock at zero, please. Okay, Councillor Cressy, you may begin. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, as I said, I will begin by placing a motion and with thanks to to staff for for their help in in pulling this together and other members of this committee. Uh, and specifically, the motion speaks to six direct parts. Uh, the first is for Council to to call on the provincial government to provide the necessary health and mental health and harm reduction supports across the system, uh, whereas right now the city is paying for some of those in some locations. Uh, the second is on a broader piece related to solutions, and that is a call on the feds and the province to fund the permanent housing solutions that we as council have confirmed our support for. That's 
the 3,000 uh, permanent spaces over the next 24 months and the ongoing supportive housing target. Uh, it is for City Council, uh, for our staff to continue to scale up their enhanced supports, both on housing and immediate essential supports within encampments. Uh, the, the fourth is for uh, staff, as recommendation number two in our report speaks to staff, uh, having the, the responsibility and the ability to scale up its winter plans if demand requires it. Uh, and this here is to clarify very, very specifically that that is to ensure physical distancing in the system as well. Uh, the fifth is to accelerate our work at the city to expand uh, the rent bank and eviction prevention. And the sixth and final is to ensure that our provincial partners with the purview for testing ensure the necessary proactive, regular and accessible testing options within the broader shelter and homelessness system. So with that, that is a series of, of amendments and thank you again to staff uh, and members of the committee for their support in working on those. Uh, I would begin my, my formal remarks by thanking our staff for their hard work and thanking our community partners our community partners are broad here. It's from the Toronto Alliance to End Homelessness to frontline providers who operate and run shelters to the drop-in network to volunteers like the Encampment Support Network, all together working hard to protect the most vulnerable. And, and in doing so, I'd thank our deputants. Uh, you know, as an elected representative, and we deal with, with the file of shelters and homelessness on a, on a constant basis, uh, I'll tell you, I guess the two most important things I've learned in my time on this file is first, the, the imperative to listen deeply to those on the front lines and those working with those on the front lines. And the second is on a personal level to always be guided as, a, as an elected representative by my own moral compass. And for me, that means to be guided by the principle that we as, as elected representatives must care for the most vulnerable and marginalized but that is the test of our city and society in doing so. And, and I, secondly, to be guided um, by, by my belief in the evidence that shows that we can actually end chronic homelessness. And that, that's, that's what's so critical here, is that since the beginning of COVID, uh, the discussion immediately turned to an emergency response, as it should and it must. Um, and in front of us here is, is the overarching objective to ensure that our ongoing emergency response during this winter protects the most vulnerable, that we have a sufficient response on every level, from accommodations to health supports to harm reduction supports. But the second critical objective here, since day one, for me, and I believe this council has been to turn that emergency response into permanent housing solutions, to use this moment of profound destabilization and pain and anguish for so many as the launching pad to ending chronic homelessness. And that, that's not impossible. Other jurisdictions have shown us the way, and I would argue that as a city, we've demonstrated that when there's political will and resources, we too can show the way. And so, you know, there's that old adage that the federal government has all the money, the provincial government has all the responsibility, and the city has all the accountability. And when we deal with a file like chronic homelessness, that's no more true than now. But at a city, we act because we must. We act because every single resident of our city deserves safe shelter. In fact, it's their human right to access shelter and housing. And so while shelters and an emergency response may not be the solution, they must be adequate, they must be comprehensive. Uh, and our work in thinking through the emergency response at all times must be guided by that fundamental objective to end chronic homelessness. Uh, Mr. Chair, those are my remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Cressy. Uh, the next uh, member of committee to speak is Councillor Ford. Councillor Ford, let me just start the time. Get the time to zero so that we yeah. can get you to start. Okay, you may begin, Councillor Ford. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And, and I would like to start off my, my brief remarks uh, by echoing uh, my colleagues' uh, sentiments towards thanking city staff. Um, uh, you know, I have had, I've worked with uh, SSHA and Marianne on a number of things, uh, a shelter that's come into my ward. 
um, and they have always been uh, incredible um, in dealing with our office, the community, concerns, uh, whatever it may be. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in this report and, and what they have done to date uh, demonstrates, uh, you know, just that. Um, and they've done a great job with it. Uh, I think this uh, this report uh, definitely uh, putting my support behind it. I think it's a, a good report. I think it's a responsible report. Um, and as um, Councillor Cressy said, this is something that uh, we've been speaking about for years um, around permanent housing and, and whatnot. So to see um, a shift with SSHA to go in that direction, I think, um, is, is the right way of uh, approaching it. Um, so uh, definitely support this. Um, I think uh, our SSHA staff have done a great job during very challenging times uh, going into COVID, um, and they and they have adapted uh, very well to such uh, difficult times. Um, so I, I'd also like to thank them uh, for that. But this is a good roadmap, and, and then just to uh, just on particularly with. Uh, uh, just to give Councillor Grimes a, a shout out uh, with uh, working uh, with staff in his community and his community with the, the shelter being proposed. Um, you know, I, uh, I remember when that, that came up and uh, Councillor Grimes was uh, working with the community and staff. Um, so just from an Etobicoke lens, I think uh, Councillor Grimes is doing great work on that. Um, and, and the community should be really uh, happy and proud of him. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Ford. Our next um, member of committee to speak is Councillor Lai. Councillor Lai, uh, let me just get the time change for you to zero. Uh, you may begin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to first thank uh, Mayor and uh, Badar, Ms. Badar, for uh, accommodating me for a meeting so all my, all my questions were being answered. I really appreciate the time that you spent with me to understand this file better. And uh, I'd like to, um, uh, you know, during the meeting, our meeting, we have we discussed about uh, uh, hidden homelessness. I just wanted to emphasize on this one here because due to COVID-19, I think there's a lot of people that are out there that are, that are homeless and they're, you know, they're temporarily homeless. And I know that we have a chronic problem with the chronic homelessness, but I think we, we need to kind of uh, deal with these um, temporary situ situation. And I'm glad that you're working with all the agencies in the city to combat these and to identify these type of uh, uh, temporary homeless people. And I also like to thank you for uh, for doing such a wonderful job and with your, your team and uh, your hard work and your tireless efforts and your accommodation to all our needs. And I mean, uh, we just cannot thank you enough. And I just, you know, really wanted to uh, uh, make sure that you, your, your team are being recognized. And I also like to thank the deputants who, who, who spend your time to come to come and, and, and share with us your, your views and especially the one that are on Lakeshore about the business the small businesses, you know, it's not easy to actually to balance the act uh, for for the, you know, uh, shelter and business and, and for you to come out and say that, you know, we need to support jobs. It might sound like off topic, but it's, it's very important, especially after the pandemic. Uh, we, you know, there are a lot of small businesses are hurting and we need to uh, provide them with shelter as well. And in that lens, I just like to thank the deputy for raising this point. And like I said, it's never an easy balancing act. Uh, just we wanted to uh, work together and it's only by working together with community partners that we can uh, cope and deal with uh, these issues. And um, the, the fact about the, um, the Scarborough um, shelter, the temporary shelter, uh, we, I do understand that uh, the need to speed has unintended consequences. But as counselor, I think we'd, we would really appreciate uh, the SSHA team to kind of give us a heads up earlier on so that as counselors, we can manage, uh, you know, we can manage the situation and some of, you know, some people, they may be against this and we just have to add, kind of work together with the community and, and, and have a, a more favorable outcome. So uh, all in all, I just want, I'm going to be supporting the recommendation going forward and thank you for uh, the time, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Lai. Um, there are no other members who have not spoken other than myself, I'll be the last speaker. Um, just get the clock 
changed to zero. Thank you. Um, I too want, as um, members of committee have offered their appreciation and thanks to Ms. Bedard and her team, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about this and many other issues as it relates to our most vulnerable members in our society. Um, I want to thank the participants who have come forward to speak and to comment on the report. This is an excellent report that really speaks to action to address a fundamental challenge and problem that this city has. The city is uh, seen as a catchment area where everyone from far and wide comes in need of help and so on, and we have not turned them away. We have offered, obviously, help, and for some it's not enough. For others, it, uh, perhaps it's too much. But I will say that our staff and the greater community, the United Way, in terms of this report that we have in front of us, want to thank them and their leadership there, and all the people who have been involved in terms of lending their voices to this issue. I've been around this environment long enough to see a cascade of people come in and storm the chamber and so on that we have not done enough and we're not doing enough. I'm, in, I'm embodied by the fact that the response that we've had to this report because of the collaboration in terms of putting it together has been extremely positive and um, very strong in support. I think history will judge us not by what we gain for ourselves personally and our own personal achievement, but what we do for those who are less fortunate and those who are in need of a helping hand. Shelter is such a fundamental um, need for, for all, and without shelter, our lives are in chaos, and we see that time and time again. We see the encampments in our parks and the response let me also say this. Our staff have been responding to the encampment and dealing with some of these issues because I get calls from people all across the city about this issue. I want to thank them of how they've approached this in a very humane way, in a way that brings integrity to this process and so on. And I know some people have complained. They're not satisfied. We're always working to refine these, um, these challenges as we face them. Um, the report really um, addresses a number of issues, and, and the, the piece around that conversation with the federal government and the border opening and so on, the refugees coming, this is an important piece because we know when the border opens, we will have more people coming in, and I think it's important to highlight that. And as been stated, I believe Councillor Carroll stated this, you know, we, we have a seat at the table as we move forward and ensure that we are part of the discussion part of the solution so we can address these fundamental issues at the beginning of the process, not later on. This is an expensive proposition in terms of helping and identifying what the needs are. I'm very encouraged that the city has taken the position that we're not simply going to stand by and wait for the other levels of government to come to the table with resources. We obviously hope that they do and want them to because it's very helpful to us because we cannot survive this, this process without additional help from the federal government and the provincial government. And I thank them for what they're contributing uh, at this point, but we've also indicated to them that it is not sufficient. So this report here um, really seeks to obviously address a fundamental challenge. I too want to commend Councillor Grimes and his efforts to address the concerns that have been brought to him by his constituents, not simply to suggest it's not in my backyard, it is simply to suggest this is not a workable solution and here are other ways that we can address these fundamental um, need for housing and provide permanent housing in this area. So I want to congratulate the community. We're not simply saying it's not in our backyard. They're suggesting to staff what is better for us. I thank Ms. Bernard for the explanation in terms of, you know, putting um, shelters in place and some of the challenges that we've had, the impacts they've had on community in general. I, again, have fielded many of those calls. I know that the mayor has fielded those calls and other members of council and so on. So it's, it's very important. And then just also to, to wrap up, I thank the, the motions that um, Councillor Cressy, in collaboration with staff and, and members of the committee, is very helpful and gives uh, good directions um, uh, to our team. We're all in this together, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is up to us to ensure that we can make a made in Toronto solution to provide and support those who are in need of housing 
and shelter, and it's something that we can't shy away from. We must do. Thank you. Um, okay, members, we have um, the motion by Councillor Cressy. Uh, Madam Clerk, I just wonder if we put those up and if we can actually ask for a vote on those um, motions. There are, I believe there are six of them all together. And so, um, all those in favor, and I can't see everyone's hand, I'm just going to assume the clerk's going to, because it's on the screen, I think we can consider the motion read, Madam Clerk. And so if we could maybe put the members up. Okay, so all those in favor, okay. Um, looks like everyone's in the favor. Uh, and there is no opposition. Okay, thank you, that carries. Um, and um, item as amended, all those in favor. So that's carry. Okay. Okay, so congratulations, remember we've dealt with uh, number one. We're now moving to item number two. Uh, Councillor Fletcher, just wondering if you are on, I don't see your name. Councillor Fletcher? All right, so members, Councillor Fletcher had a motion which I am going to take carriage of. It's a simple one that basically asks staff to look at alternative opportunities or options in the precinct area. I think it's, it's, um, it's a good motion and I will be pleased to move it on her behalf. And so it's on the screen. If members have any questions, um, I think it's pretty clear. So if members are in agreement, um, we will, uh, we will take the matter and, and have a vote on the matter. All those in favor, and just hoping up the screen so I can see the screen to ensure that we see everyone's hands. Okay, oppose, that's carried. Thank you very much. So we have dispensed with item one and two. We are now moving to uh, EC 16.3, improving the imagination, manufacturing, innovation, and, and technology, the IMET local employment um, requirement. It's an extension of the program, and I had held that, and I would just like to ask the general manager of economic development um, why the extension, um, what are we trying to achieve, and um, if you could just provide an explanation to us, please. Mr. Williams, are you there? Yeah, certainly, uh, Deputy Mayor, happy to address that. Um, as you know, uh, over a year ago, council approved an IMIT uh, enhancement uh, from discussions with uh, various councillors about how to improve the uh, benefits to the community. The major focus of that was on the employment uh, criteria, but also on uh, um, the uh, sustainability of projects. And part of that, we recommended, and it was accepted by council to undertake a pilot, in which we would put in place a point system of a, of a range of um, activities that an IMET grant recipient and the tenants of that building could use to uh, stick or adhere to the IMET requirements. Uh, so it was sort of a bit like a, a uh, cafeteria style where they could pick those things that made the most sense for their particular project and for their way of operating, but that still provided very definitive, back, uh, definitive benefits to the community and to the city. Uh, that program was put in place uh, at the end of uh, 19 and early in 20, and we got very good cooperation from IMET, existing IMET and IMET applicants to the concept. But once COVID hit, uh, a lot of things changed. A lot of the buildings uh, that IMET uh, was on uh, for uh, largely uh, closed from the point of view of staff. And um, so there's significant disruption. Uh, and therefore, um, our evaluation of how suitable this points based system approach is is uh, compromised by uh, uh, by COVID and by uh, a lot of the changes that have happened in the office space in Toronto. So uh, our request in this motion, uh, we were sorry, I should have also pointed out that we were asked to report back at the end of this year 
on the impact and the uh, efficacy of, of the point-based system. Uh, unfortunately, we feel that's impossible to do given the disruptions that we've had to COVID and the reaction to geographic distancing and the impacts on the workplace. And we're asking for a two-year extension since it's clear that this uh, crisis, this health crisis is gonna last some, some time and especially uh, time afterwards for people to get back into the whatever the new normal will be. And so this report asks for a two-year extension to reporting back on the uh, uh, impacts of the points-based system for qualifying for IMED grants on a year-to-year -year basis. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Okay. Williams. Um, I have no further questions. I'm just wanting to see whether or not any members have any questions. I see, Councillor Carroll, is that your? I see, okay, I see Councillor Carroll's hands raised. Councillor Carroll, you may begin. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure uh, I'm fine with giving an, an extension and, and I, you know, I got my back up at the beginning of the report and by the end, you wore me down. So <laughs> I get the, the extension, but we're going right to the end of this term before we're really going to find out. So I just want to, to hear from you, if you will, that there's still a real focus on making sure that this this results in it that there's a real push that that they meet the 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 points list wherever possible that they're meeting it with real employment and 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 scaling up people's capacity because I, that's been a frustration in the in the overarching in the whole social procurement policy that's been a frustration that people look for the easiest route to just meet the bare minimum and that here there has to be a real push because this is a big 10 year incentive they're getting um, are you know in the initial months that leading up to the pandemic were you seeing the the inquiries we need and uh, yeah, we were really we were understood very... it's employment and training we're looking for we were very uh, pleased with the response from the community and there are still some employers that have IMA grants right now that it makes mm -hmm. sense to continue with so the manufacturing for instance is being less disrupted than the uh, downtown office market or the office market. So with those those companies, we will continue to work and for all companies. And so we continue uh, to work with all companies. They've been disrupted, they have hard time. Uh, many companies are not hiring that are in these buildings. So it's a little difficult to impose a risk uh, to get uh, feedback there from that. But I, we're, right. we're hardened by it. We're hardened by the feedback okay. from the developers, from the uh, tenants. So I think, Councillor, uh, you'll be uh, you'll be satisfied by the end of by the end of the two years, based okay. upon what we've seen and, so far. And there, there, our benefit doesn't get pulled away if they if they they become eligible in some cases for wage subsidy and things like that that have been offered for the pandemic. We don't claw ours away, do we? Because it's it would be complicated oh. to do that. It's tax based and it's ten years. That continues, so they have added reason right. to take part in the program. Correct. Okay, and, fantastic. And we 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 continue. Staff, Rebecca's on the call. Are very digital, diligent in how they communicate with with all of these grantees. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Carroll. I'm just looking to see whether or not there are any other members who may have questions. I see none. Um, I don't need to speak on this item other than just to, to move it and thank the general manager for the update. I think it was essential that members be afforded an explanation as to why the action that, uh, as part of the recommendation is being taken. And I do agree with the general manager um, on this, um, the, the, uh, with respect to his comments and the staff recommendations that are are here. So I'd like to move uh, the item. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. Moving right along. We're now moving to um, our next item, which is uh, EC 16.4, the feasibility of uh, mitigation efforts to prevent misadventure at the Scarborough Bluffs. Councillor Lai. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a, a few questions uh, to ask staff, please. Um, First of all, about uh, in the report, it says about the signage. There, there have been change in the messaging of the signage. 
I remember asking this question the last time when I was on this committee and uh, we were, I was shown that the signage there was like a, a picture. So can, can someone tell me what the messaging of the signage now has, has changed to? We seem we seem to have a problem with your connection. I wonder if we could maybe just ask that. Maybe just to. Okay, we're having a problem with the connection. Um, what can we do here? Maybe stand it down, go on the next item so he gets better connection. Yeah, just yeah, just just give me a second, please, Councilor Grahn. Okay, members, um, Councilor Lai, we're going to hold this item down. We're going to come back because we're having some communication challenges with staff. So let's hold this down for a few minutes, and we'll move to the next item. We'll come back to this one uh, in a moment as soon as we can. Okay, thank you. All right, so members, we're now moving to. Um, uh, EX 16.5, which is a request uh, for authority to exercise option years on contract number 4702528 for the provision of firefighters structural bunker suit. Councillor Carroll, you had held this item. Over to uh, you. Yes, thank you. I have some questions of staff. Can you make begin? We'll cool. start your time now. Uh, yeah, I might be asking questions of the same person so uh we may we may still have a problem yeah let's see uh, but, but there is a question that i can ask the the director of procurement uh, as well if if he's there uh, i'm just i'm 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 kind of surprised by this report because it it goes into great detail telling us about their uh you know the making sure that that this uh, uh contract holder is taking part in social procurement and such but it doesn't go into great length at telling me why in the fourth year of a five-year contract we're asking for all five of the extension years possible to the point where we're actually giving we're actually giving a contract holder a six-year lead time and a 10-year contract uh before we're going to go out again to test the market um can you tell me what the rationale is for that because i can't find it in the report through the chair, hopefully you can hear me all right. Um, it's a uh, yes, it's my perfect. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the original RFQ that was done was actually for a 10 year contract. It was five years plus five one year options. That was the original intention of the RFQ back in 2015, 2016. The reason we're asking for the flexibility <laughs> of giving the general manager uh, of fire services the ability to exercise the option years is that this is such a key uh, critical piece of equipment for them they need to ensure that there's a contract in place um, at all times and the procurement process typically takes about 18 months for this because of the evaluation needed for the fire the bunker suits themselves uh, there's a very uh, heavy ergonomics piece that needs to be evaluated. And so they need the flexibility to ensure that they have the ability to order these suits um, for their new recruits and for any damaged suits each year. And then they do a bulk purchase every five years. Okay. And, and, and I get that, but but you know, an 18 month process really, even if we waited till the end of the contract, that takes me to the end of uh, from now to the end of 22. Even if we waited to the end of contract, you could op you could exercise two option years, and that takes you to the end of 2023. So the question is, why did we why did we why were we reluctant to just give a 10 year contract in the first place? What what made us think let's wait for five? Uh, for the, the first five years to, to, to look at options as opposed to just giving them a 10 year contract. Um, 
is this a is this a narrow field or there are very few suppliers of these that would be qualified proponents for us uh, through the chair the the reason uh that i take from what happened five years ago was in relation to social procurement this is why why we talk a bit about social procurement it was a 10-year contract it was over five million dollars in value and social procurement was uh in development but this RFQ actually happened right. uh, and was initiated before we landed on the policy approved by council. So we didn't ever have an opportunity to assess whether this type of contract, which is a, a very important goods contract, would be appropriate to build in workforce development opportunities. So the committee at the time said, okay, you can have your five-year contract because you need the suit, come back and let us know what what is possible so we're we're work, we're trying to work with the uh supplier to see if there's a mechanism of sorts that can be introduced into the contract now it's not as easy as construction contracts this company is located yeah. in quebec and they have a very defined supply chain and to your earlier question there is very few players in the market so while we're going to work with them, and I, and I think they're, they just sent a letter to us yesterday that they're having trouble identifying how they could make this work in this context, like we will continue to work with them and try to find a solution to this. But that's why uh, the committee at the time only gave us the five years. Okay. Okay. That, that helps me a lot. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Carroll. Um, I don't see any uh, additional questioners or questions from members of the committee. So, Councillor Carroll, did you wish to speak on this item? Well, if I could, and this is awkward now because of the virtual meeting, I would love to, to add a motion to the recommendations for a report back. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm satisfied with, with, the, with the asking for the extension. But I really would like to hear back from the chief or, or, or back from, from, uh, from anyone on, uh, you know, I'd love for them to report back in two years time. So I'm, I'm trying to move it out, uh, cross your fingers beyond the pandemic to really hear back from them that they really made an effort in this regard. Because the whole purpose of social procurement was that we really start to look at it as there's a way to do this in every case that with that social procurement policy was not just about uh constructions and the kind of hard and concrete things where where it's easy to throw jobs in you know uh where these are manufactured where they sit where where is the agency in that community that they can actually pull in um who packs these bunker suits that come to toronto is there an agency of of developmentally delayed adults in this town in Quebec that could be packing these suits that come to us. You know, that's the level at which social procurement can be done if you're really robust about it. And so, you know, I was really concerned on two counts that uh, that uh, um, that they seem to be looking at just, can we make a donation to an agency and we're done and tick a box? And, and also concerned that we're giving a really big renewal here. We're really, giving six years more life to this contract because we're only four years into it. I, I hear the director of procurement satisfied that they meet the, all of the reasons for renewing so that they're just making a bulk purchase every five years. But that report back two years from now um, allows us to make sure that any of our divisions, when they make a big purchase, you can't just say, oh, and could you tick the social procurement box? that we really have to push on it and we really have to make them go out there and find a way to really engage in, in the social procurement piece of this. Because we are the biggest buyer of, of equipment and services across the country. And so we really have to push that in every community, our money landing in that community helps that community. When we land our money in our own community, we make sure that, that, that it results in employment and to show ethical and, and social practices, we should be pushing on that in any place in the nation that, that, that our, our money lands, our city of Toronto tax money lands. 
You want to constantly be building the capacity of Canadians because we just spent the entire morning discussing that when that when we don't do that, the people who fall through the cracks start making their way to Toronto and Toronto houses them. Better we should employ them wherever they sit right now. And that's what the social procurement policy was about. And so recommendation one, yes, but that adding that recommendation number two that the that the the chief report back in two years on how the social procurement aspect of this contract is going is, I think, more than enough time for him to follow up. Those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Carroll. Councillor Carroll, I'm going to hold this item down and just ask that you work with the clerks off to just to ensure the motion is correct. Clerk and I. Oh, okay. The, yeah, the clerk and I have been talking a little bit about it, and I know that the uh, the the chief and and the deputy and so on. I don't think they have any problems with it. We just want to make sure that we craft it sufficiently so that members can support you. So we're just going to hold it down, and if you could maybe just send some text uh, as part of language. Super. In, I'll send a type version. Yes. Pl please. Thank you. Okay. And we'll hold this down, and we'll take yeah. the vote after. Okay. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Carroll. Okay, thank you. Uh, members, we're going to um, go back to um, the item that we were um, having some challenges on, which is EC 16.4. I believe uh, Deputy um, Chief Jessup has, um, able to, is able to call in by phone. So, uh, Councillor Lai, uh, we'll return back to you, and you have the floor to question. Uh, five minutes, um, and I'm hoping that the connection will work. Okay, let's try. Th yes, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, my first question would be about the signage um, on the report. In the report, it says that there's change in signage uh, messaging. Uh, I remember the last meeting uh, when I asked about that. Uh, it, it, uh, it was a picture that was shown. I'm just wondering what the new signage is going to be uh, or has it been posted yet so mr chair it's uh it's uh, jim jessup can you hear me sir yes jim loud yes, and clear yes, we can hear you. thank you that's great thank you and i apologize for the uh the technical challenges this morning um uh, so uh counselor through the chair i think uh it's appropriate i defer to uh pfnr on that as it is uh it is their signage uh, toronto fires really has nothing to do with posting signages so i'm I'm, I'm going to defer to my uh, colleagues at PFNR for that first question. To the chair, um, Councillor, the new signs have been installed and they have um, large pictographs on them um, along with some messages. And there's six different signs um, that have been installed um, along the bluffs. Would you like me to review the specific messages? Uh, if, if, you, if I may, please, if you have it handy. I do. Um, danger, steep drop. Bluffs can collapse. Keep away from the edge. Do not climb the bluffs. Caution falling debris. And do not cross fencing. And as I said, there's large pictographs on each of them. So there's picture <laughs> as, as well as uh, messages in, in yes, on those signs. Is that correct? Uh, any any different languages in there? Just uh, just the English. Just English in the picture. Okay, English in the picture. Thank you. And uh, my second question would be um, through the chair. The uh, you uh, in the report it says uh, no uh, on education. It says no further action is required, and uh, their current public education efforts. I'm just wondering what are those education efforts uh, that uh, the currently that is uh, that we're having. So again, it's uh, it's uh, Jim Jessup again through the chair. Since Toronto Fire Services doesn't have jurisdiction over that, I'll defer to our PF and our partners. So we work uh, through the chair, Councillor. We work with municipal licensing um, and standards on the education piece. Um, we have the signage components, um, and we also work um, through officers on um, on education and enforcement. Um, if MLS is on the line, I could defer that piece over to them. Hi, it's it's Carlton. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, yeah, we work closely with parks and our, our education is being, is being out there, being present in, uh, at, at the bluffs to educate people that it's not safe. Okay, thank you. So your education is just uh, in person, right? You, uh, the MLS uh, staff will go out there and educate people in the bluffs. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's correct. correct. Thank you. And uh, my last question, uh, finally, is about the fines. Uh, you've increased the fine from $205 to $750 since March 2020. Has has this been in place already? So the fine is in place now for yeah, the increase increase in fines. Yes, it's it's in place, and we have used it um, since the since the throughout the pandemic. Okay, and then in the report it says next step is for communication. Do we have a communication plan in place uh, to how to communicate all these uh, uh, to warn people about the danger of the bluff and about the uh, the increase in fine and all that? Uh, how are we communicating to the communities? So I would I would suggest that that is ongoing work uh, that we work with strategic communications just like we have been working throughout this this past weekend. Um, for example, in Etobicoke, we had a number of issues with bonfires, and so we work um, closely with Stratcom to get those messages out there with press releases. So we would do the same thing uh, with uh, what's 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 happening at the bluffs and in Scarborough that people you know warn them of the dangers of of taking selfies at the bluffs and what could happen. And, and I like the, the importance of the resources of fire and MLS not being used uh, for that type of enforcement or rescues. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Those are my questions. Thank you very much, Councillor Lai. And Councillor Lai, do you wish to speak on this item? Yes, please, Mr. Chair. I do have a motion. If uh, Clerk can please uh, put it up. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, please, Clerk. Thank you. Uh, I do have a motion uh, to request for uh, any to provide signage and education material in traditional Chinese language to promote uh, safety and prevent misadventures at the Scarborough Bluff. Uh, let me start by thanking staff for doing a good job in uh, in doing all this, um, you know, uh, making, ensuring, and being proactively to ensure our our citizens are safe, especially uh, of the mishap that has been happening on Scarborough Bluff. Scarborough Bluff is just south of my ward. And uh, I, I, I freaked out in the last few days when someone actually, during the pandemic, there was a blogger uh, on WeChat leading people to this very, very beautiful place that they, they should go and visit. And I followed the article and it was to the Scarborough Bluff. And when, you know, and then they said on the article that when they arrived there, their signage is saying there, you know, they, they don't know what it's all about and, and you know, it's dangerous pictures and all that, and then they, they had to leave. So that really prompted me. This is a very, very timely uh, report that came out. And I think uh, because in Scarborough, although the bluffs in, is in uh, Ward 22, 24, and 20, uh, 25, and but I'm what 23, and there's a, a very li high likelihood of uh, of I in my ward we we have uh, over 46 percent of Chinese people that don't they don't uh, some of them don't uh, don't speak English or they they don't they cannot read English. So I'm just wondering the danger of them, and especially when they have tourists that's visiting here. Now we don't have any tourists because of the pandemic. But during the pandemic, they're going down there, and then they are not being educated or being communicated. With uh, with the danger of, uh, of of visiting the bluff, so I would uh, hope that um, uh, my colleagues would support this motion just to be proactively dealing with people. And in terms of communication plan, I think what we can do better is that uh, we can, like uh, Couchin, you said that we do we do have uh, issue media advisory. I think we do have a lot of earned medias that we can tap into. And I'll be more than happy to circulate them to 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 the, to the Chinese media or to uh, for people who have other medias. You know, the Tamil media, the, the Scarborough residents. We have different uh, ethnic people that lives in in Scarborough. So it's very important that we 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 take advantage of the earned media and maybe a Scarborough Mirror, whatever. We should we should do more in terms of the communication plan so we can communicate to the residents and proactively we, we can avoid uh, some of these mishap that happens uh, in the Scarborough Bluff. So having said all that, I'd like to uh, ask my colleagues to support my motion, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Lai. I'm just waiting for the screen to come up Bravo. to see if there's any questions of you. Um, thank you, I've seen none. I get the two fingers 
a thumbs up for two thumbs, two, <laughs> two thumbs up from Councillor Carroll. I thought I saw some fingers as well pointing at me. He's like, bam, bam. But uh, apparently there were just lots of flurry of activities happening with the thumbs. All right, so members, um, Councillor has a uh, motion on the screen. Um, all those in favor? Oppose? Carried? Uh, item as amended. All those in favor? Oppose? Carried? Thank you very much. Okay, so we are going to, thank you very much, Councillor Lai. We're now going to move. Thank you. You're welcome. We're now going to move back. Uh, Councillor Carroll, I think your motion, okay, it's not ready as yet. All right, so Councillor Carroll, we'll come back to that item, uh, EC 16.5. We're now going to move to EC 16.6. Um, uh, and we have a speaker on this item. Uh, the speaker is Greg Jarvis. And the uh, Greg's with the Flowers of Hell. Um, Mr. Jarvis, are you on the uh, line? Mr. Jarvis? Greg Jarvis, you've been granted audio. Please connect your mic. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Jarvis, are you there? Greg Jarvis going once. Greg Jarvis going twice. Hear me now? Is he there? Hear me now. Okay. okay. All right, Mr. Jarvis, are you there? I, I, I am here. Oh, here? fantastic. We can't. Can you turn him up a bit? It's very low. Just bear with us in a moment, Miss, for a moment, Mr. Jarvis. We're just going to get your volume up. Mr. Jarvis, can you speak for me just so let's okay. check your volume? Okay, yeah. Fantastic, yes. okay. Give me one moment, sir. Okay, great. We're good? Okay, Mr. Jarvis, thank you. Thank you for your patience, and thank you for hanging in there all morning. It's uh, been a long morning, so long morning, welcome sir. to the Economic and Community Development Committee meeting. You'll have five minutes to speak. When you get to the four minutes and 30 second mark, I will let you know you've got 30 seconds left to speak in order to, in to close at five minutes. So you are speaking, sir, on EC 16.6, support for artists and musicians during COVID-19 pandemic. You have the floor, sir. You have five minutes. You may begin now. Thank you very much. And I want to speak directly to point two of those recommendations about affordable housing for musicians in Toronto. My background is I've been in the music business for 30 years with major labels in Toronto, in Moscow, in Prague, and in London, England. I'm currently a professor of music business with an MBA from York. And I'm also a performing artist. My last performances before the crisis hit was at the Tate Britain, the Moscow Conservatory, and a home in Dufferin Grove, a home where musician tenants live and would have other musicians over to play. Exactly the sort of thing that sustains this city's culture. I think one issue we're going to face is we have a situation where musicians are leaving Toronto due to problems with being able to afford the high rents here. Yet the cultural tourism, especially the music side of that, well, as it came out in the city's revenues report last week, those venues that these musicians perform in are contributing $850 million annually to the local economy. So we need not only to retain that music business infrastructure here, but we also need to retain the music communities that it's reliant upon. And to do that, we need to retain the grassroots artists who are the pillars of those communities. CERB was the same amount whether people were paying a Toronto rent or whether they were paying a rent out in the Maritimes. And so, for many musicians, the decisions are getting made. Hmm, is now the time to leave and move to the countryside or move to Hamilton, move to Montreal, move to Guelph, move to somewhere where life is more affordable? I believe that the way to handle things is to offer rent top-ups to the musicians who've been performing regularly in Toronto over recent years. Many of them have been underpaid for those performances and work low-paid jobs but they do it out of the passion and they contribute so much to the city in that way. 
if we lose them to other municipalities, we're going to struggle to get them on back here. Once they become enmeshed in other communities, it's much harder to decide to come back to Toronto and pay the high rents here. Unlike in the past, as the world of music has moved over onto streaming services and social media, they no longer need, need to live in Toronto to have the Toronto Star, to have Now Magazine, to have the major labels and independent labels here support them. They can sustain their own careers from anywhere in this country or in this province. If we lose them, you lose the core customers of the music business infrastructure, and you lose, again, the pillars of those communities around it. In order to keep Toronto's cultural tourism, once COVID is over, for us to regain that, we're going to need those people that make this city cool, that make the city a place that others want to come to. If all we're left with is a bland world of chain with no artists about, we have little to offer to attract those tourists here. So, in summary, I feel we need to stem the rising exodus of Toronto talent by providing rent top-up payments for local musicians who've performed here regularly over recent years in order to position the city to regain the benefits of cultural tourism post-COVID. And uh, that's most of what I wanted to say to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jarvis. Um, I'm just looking to see whether or not there are any questions of you. Um, I see none. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, members, um, we will take this uh, into Councillor Cressy. You wanted to provide some updates on this, uh, these two items, right? Correct? Because I held them down for that specific purpose. Uh, yes, and I believe we have speakers on the next item as well listed. Yes, but we'll get to the next item when we get to that. So we'll just deal with this one right now. So did you want to um, speak on this one and provide the updates? Do you have a motion? Yeah. Okay, thanks. You, I, ha you have I, the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, I can begin by placing an amendment in light of the announcement from the federal government on Friday uh, around extending the Canada work emergency wage subsidy. Uh, working with staff, we've amended the motion slightly based on those announcements. So the amended version is here in front of you from staff. And, and huge thanks to Marguerite and, and Mike Tanner and Mike Williams for working to turn that around in time. Uh, maybe just a couple broad comments, if, if you'll indulge me, Mr. Chair and Committee. Uh, at our meet, last meeting of the Toronto Music Advisory Committee, uh, we had a really fulsome conversation about the music ecosystem writ large. We, we certainly know that venues are a critical part of that. They were amongst the first to close and sadly uh, will probably be amongst the last to reopen back to full capacity. And, and we're going to talk about venues on the next item. But the broader music ecosystem that needs to be considered here is the artists themselves, the music companies, the bookers, the engineers, as well as the venues. And so the item in front of us here talks about support for artists. And, and I think that the Greg, our deputant, Greg Jarvis's deputation there was so spot on because you know, live music is not a, it's not a nice to have. In a world-class city like Toronto's, it, it is indeed a must have. Uh, and not simply because it gives life and soul and dynamism to a city and provides that cultural fabric that's so critical, it's also, and this committee deals directly with this, uh, it's about economic development. $850 million a year is derived from the live music sector. And so given that we need to, to not only manage the storm of COVID, but come out of this stronger, thinking about artists and musicians, if they can't afford to live here, then they can't afford to perform here. And if you can't afford to work here and live here, well, then you're never going to perform here. And so the recommendations in front of us, certainly it calls on the country to ensure that the, the, the financial support that's provided is accessible to self-employed and gig workers, of which many musicians are. But it also calls on, on us and our city manager to look at issues related to universal income supports and affordable housing for our artists and to report back specifically on those measures and others. And so, you know, the, the, our objective for both the live music uh, industry, the musicians and the venues at large should not be simply to come out of COVID having mitigated the loss, but rather to come out of COVID in a stronger position than before. 
And so that's the impetus behind this. And, and I want to again thank the, the music office and the staff in EDC for all their relentless hard work and the members of TMAC. Importantly, I should note our chair, Councillor Deputy Mayor Thompson, who was the first chair of TMAC and has been a relentless supporter and defender of the industry. And so with deep thanks and gratitude to them and all the members of TMAC for helping bring this forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Cressy. I'm just checked to see whether or not there are any questions of you. Um, I see none. I think that you have uh, succinctly put this um, issue into solid perspective and the uh, changes in collaboration with staff that you have moved, um, I certainly can support and uh, certainly hope that members will also support as well. So uh, the item is uh, in front of us here, the, um, the changes, the amendments to the motion. Um, all those in favor? Okay, I can see all the hands. Okay, pose, that's done. Um, uh, clause is amended. All those in favor? Pose, that's carried. Thank you. Uh, members, I'd like to ask uh, your permission, your indulgence, actually. We have two items basically left, or two and a half. Uh, Councilor Carroll, we'll just have to deal with your motion. And um, we are going to be fast running. We have two deputants, and so I'd like to ask uh, for uh, an extension to, to ensure that we can extend to complete the agenda. It will probably take us maybe, at, I imagine, max at quarter to one. So I'm going to move that we um, extend uh, past the scheduled lunch break to complete the agenda. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. Um, and so uh, with that... Mr. Chair? Yes, Councillor Carroll? Mr. Chair, I just have one challenge. At, at, at 1240, I have to, to uh, step out for a quick interview. So sure. uh, I, I've re returned an approval of my motion. If you want to deal with that first, we can get uh, five out of the way. Well, she's ready. Councilor Carroll, your motion's ready. We can deal with it right now. Okay, thank you. So um, we'll just have put it on the screen and um, have members read the motion, but it was pretty clear in your explanation of what you intended on doing. Maybe you just wish to comment on it briefly, and then we can take it to a vote. If you wish to do that. If not, it's... Well, just quickly... Just quickly, uh, the, if, if we can consider it read, because yes, okay. I've already spoken to it once, this just takes the the, uh, the reporting back specifically on the SPP part out to the end of the term so that we can just get a progress report to, uh, so that we're, we're well aware before we go into the next procurement process. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much, Councillor Carroll. Uh, the motion's on the screen, members. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Clause as amended. All those in favor? Oppose, that's carried. Thank you. We've dispensed with that item, 16.5. We're now moving to uh, EC 16.7, current impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on live music venues in Toronto. We have two speakers. Uh, the first speaker I have is uh, Jeff Cohen, Horseshoe Tavern and Lee's uh, Palace. Uh, Mr. Cohen is no stranger to this committee. I'd like to welcome uh, Jeff uh, to economic and community development uh, meeting. Uh, you have five minutes to speak and at the four minutes and 30 seconds mark, I will let you know you've got 30 seconds left. So Mr. Cohen, you are on, you have five minutes, welcome. Jeff Cohen, you have audio. Please connect your mic. Okay. I'll... Ah, Jeff Cohen, are you there? Yes, I'm trying to speak. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. You have five minutes. Go ahead, please. Specifically about fair and more flexible reopening guidelines, in particular uh, referencing, uh, trying to educate the councillors and the committee on provincial regulation 364-20. Uh, this regulation was introduced by the Ford government in mid-July 
which gave live music venues in the city of Toronto the opportunity to reopen. But there's a huge problem with the regulation that unfortunately has led to only maybe 10 or 12 percent of eligible live music venues in the city to reopen. And that's because unlike most of the other provisions in regulation 364.20, which allowed uh, cinemas, bars, restaurants, and event spaces to open to a cap hard of 50, but to be able to apply for an exemption at the city or the province, they have not allowed any live music venue in the city of Toronto equal standing to apply for those exemptions. Uh, this is discriminatory and unfortunately very unfair and unfortunately has led to an important sector um, in the Toronto economy, especially in downtown Toronto, not be able to participate in the reopening of businesses from mid-July to recently October the 10th. Now, obviously, we have all just been closed indoors by provincial civil authority and can't reopen for now 24 more days until Saturday, November the 7th. So I realize the timing of this may be a little suspect, but our issue is, is we want to be part of the reopening of the economy in downtown Toronto and the nighttime economy and a very vibrant part of the reopening of the province. And regulation 6420 is leaving us behind. When we do reopen, either on November 7th or later in November or December, when infections, daily infections are lower in the province and we get back to phase three, the problem is going to be is we're still capped at a very unreasonable 50 with no opportunity to present a plan to the city or the province to have a higher capacity. And it's just not fair. Restaurants were able to go up to 30%, maximum 200. Uh, cinemas are able to present a plan to be able to go higher than 50 and so are event spaces and i guess we're looking for some help from the city to have the city counterpart be able to go to the provincial counterparts and do something to either get in the regulation live music taken out of the performing arts section which we are not fear opera I, I believe we're not performing arts we're, we're a bar to either be moved in the bar restaurant category or to try and convince the province to create a new subcategory in regulation 36420 for live music so that we can have the same business opportunities as a bar, restaurant, cinema, or event space. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, presentation, Mr. Cohen. Are there any questions for Mr. Cohen? Okay, seeing none, thank you. All right, our next uh, speaker is uh, Ms. Lisa Zabitniu. Um, Ms. Zabitniu, are you there? She's connecting, okay, thank you. We'll just wait for Lisa to connect. Lisa, are you there? Okay, thanks. Hello, Lisa, you've been granted audio privileges. Please connect your mic. Is she connecting? Okay. Can you speak to her to ask her to connect? Yes. Okay, thank you. So why don't we do this? Why don't we move to uh, just hold this down for a Quick minute then. Uh, Councillor Lai, we can move to you at, uh, to deal with uh, EC 16.8, which is the Toronto Nighttime Economy Update. And then we'll come back you, to um, Lisa. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I just have a couple of questions of staff and uh, uh, on this item. 
it says on the recommendation that it is uh, going to process for updating the Toronto music strategy. I, I think it's just a very simple recommendation. I just wanted to ask about, uh, I read the report and all that about the night economy. And uh, we have a pre-COVID plan and we have current priorities. And uh, I, I, I assume that we're gonna do a post-COVID post plan on, uh, on on the next report. Just wondering, um, I read in the report uh, that include current priorities about Show Love Toronto and then Winter Patio and all that. Has Drive-In TO been included in uh, some of these plans? Given the COVID situation now, we're doing things on drive-in. Yes, we are. <laughs> Councillor, it's Mike Williams. I'm gonna turn this over to Marguerite Piggott, who's uh, probably closer to the answer than I am. Marguerite. Uh, thanks, Mike. So uh, drive-in TO um, certainly has been very active during the warmer months when people are going to be comfortable, uh, more comfortable spending time in their car. We know that, uh, um, you know, we'll be probably still working on show love TO come spring and summer. And so dry um, drive-in TO will definitely be part of those plans. It's a seasonal initiative. So seasonal meaning that um... Uh, they will not be done in the winter, is that correct? That's right. I see. And um, in terms of um, uh, soliciting venues for driving TO, uh, what are the criteria of doing that uh, uh, across the city? Well, we do make sure that um, the venues are spread across the city. So we do look to make sure that we're offering value, uh, you know, in, in, in all quadrants of the city. Um, there needs to be substantial room for cars to be parked and for cars to be parked even then um, at socially distanced, uh, uh, you know, within socially distanced guidelines and so on. There needs to be room to build a stage uh, and so on. So we look to make these events as accessible as possible. So we also look for drive in TO to, you know, to the fullest extent possible, not be available solely just to people with cars. We also look for whether or not people are including online components, um, whether what's being projected could be viewed from outside the, the parking area and so on. So you said that the four quadrums of, uh, quadrums of Toronto, um, can you identify some of the, uh, the ones in the north and in the suburban, more suburban area uh, yeah, that I mean, is in, in the driving teal. So the one that we've been speaking to in the east end of the city is the zoo. So uh, we'll be looking at, at working with the zoo uh, out there. Yeah, I see. And uh, do you, do we, the, the staff go out to solicit people? I mean, I heard that there's uh, uh, some malls that, that they actually doing, uh, they wanted to apply for that and uh, the do we go out, staff go out to solicit people or do they work with people or with consultants? How does that work? I just wanted to understand it better. Right, so um, at the beginning of COVID when recovery measures started to occur, uh, we um, got a lot of applications. We got not even applications, just people reaching out wanting to contribute what they could. So we did hear from malls at times like that. Um, going forward, Show Love TO is going to be um, progressively more partnership driven. So we will be um, reaching out to third party organizations um, to, uh, to form partnerships so that Show Love TO can be community led and, and very inclusive in that way. Just a further the question. The mayor actually did a call out for those kinds of, of relationships. Yeah, just a uh, further to that question, do you sometimes maybe perhaps work with local councillors and to see whether they have, uh, you know, a, a prospect, uh, you know, potential partners in that kind of a, a situation, you know, now that COVID has changed our normal things of doing things, right? Normal way of doing things. So do you reach out yeah, to absolutely. councillors uh, and, uh, you know, work with their offices and kind of find the partners and all that? Absolutely, Councillor Lai. So uh, that, it, first of all, is a great opportunity. So let me say it's very, very welcome. Um, when Show Love TO was launched, uh, a package was sent, an e email uh, package was sent to every councillor. Um, we're happy to follow up on that periodically as we move through the programming. Right now, we're looking forward to winter programming and winter activations. And so we're certainly very open to um, hearing from councillors' offices with regard to who you would recommend we partner with, um, any events that you think are appropriate for Show Love TO and, and that are 
um, compliant with Toronto public health guidelines, we would be very, very welcoming of that kind of um, outreach. Yeah, thank you. Then my last question is, um, in the report, it says your internal working group going forward in the future. Um, what, uh, who, who will be sitting on this working group? Is it just staff or how, I mean, who are the, uh, the members of this uh, internal working group? The internal working group is staff. So when you look at Show Love To You, you'll see that there are initiatives from transportation that are included. There are initiatives from arts and culture services, from business growth services. We expect that over the winter time, there will be more initiatives from parks, forestry, and recreation that are included. So it is interdivisional. Um, there is also an external working group that includes groups like um, Indigenous Tourism Ontario, um, Rise Edutainment, maybe believe sports and entertainment and and groups like that that we hope will be helping us to amplify um, our outreach to different communities uh, across the city so we do have an external working group as well we not uh, we do because I, I yeah i just wanted to make sure that we we are very inclusive and all that yeah uh, about different groups of people that we work with and just to make it so like the uh, whole toronto uh, thing uh, thank you councilor Lai. Question, that's five sorry. minutes Thank okay, you. sorry. Thank just, you. I just I just wanted the one last question about the TMAP team. What does TMAP stand for? Sorry, Mr. Chair. Toronto Music Advisory Committee. Okay. All right then. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank All you. All right. So, Council Lai to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to first of all thank um, economic development staff for actually helping out my uh, uh, my driving TO initiative in my ward. I think. Uh, on this report here, night economy, I think we have uh, uh, discovered a very good thing of uh, doing some, uh, in my ward, we had uh, uh, a mall owner who would like to partner with us and do a driving TO. We had a, a, a theater. Well, it's not a theater, it's a cinema. Okay, so it's like a drive-in cinema kind of situation. And we have entertained uh, in the last month, probably over a thousand cars. So. Uh, it, and and it is, there's no noise and it's very quiet and people just sit in the car and then they just turn into a FM station to get the sound. And then they are they're just watching a movie and all that. And it's very, very, very uh, entertaining. And it's very family, uh, situ uh, family uh, entertainment for that uh, during COVID-19. I just wanted to maybe add my voice to, to the, uh, your next report coming back for Night Economy because uh, uh, it, it's very important that we, during the COVID, I think post-COVID, we have to be very careful about all these social distancing, all that. But I think we do have uh, some opportunities there and to reach out to uh, different locations and, and do drive-in stuff and uh, drive-in uh, uh, entertainment, whatever. It could be a stage, it could be a drive-in show. And we had that in, in, in my neck of the wood and it's very successful and people re really appreciate that. And we do actually have a live stream of that event as well. So people can watch it at the comfort of their home. And I uh, just wanted to um, share my, uh, my, my input into all these night economy, night economy uh, program. And uh, I just, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Lai. Just looking to see if there are any further speakers on this item. Okay, so I will speak as the city's uh, first uh, night economy ambassador, and I want to thank uh, Marguerite um, um, and staff, uh, uh, Mike Tanner, and others, um, Alok Sharma, uh, for the great work that is being done in this area. Um, we have, as you brought out through your questioning, Councillor Lai, we have an internal working group, we have an external working group, uh, we have a Slack platform where uh, information is presented to the group and there's uh, cross-collaboration of conversation that's taking place. This update is to uh, provide members of Council the stat update in terms of where we are, looking at our priorities and so on. We were obviously and have been affected like everyone else with a pandemic, our stakeholder consultation had to be suspended and so on. We are looking at um, you know, additional ways in terms of reach out. We are reaching out, vast array of, 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 of communications that's taking place. Lots of conversations uh, take, uh, is, is, is going on around how we move the nighttime economy 
And just for the record, it isn't simply about extending bar hours and just simply uh, creating some music. It's a vast array of, of, of things, including you know, looking at how people go to work, manufacturing, whether or not it's uh, issues around nighttime, day care, nighttime care for children that uh, residents will need, um, transportation. And so all of this uh, work is being done to addressing the issue around you know, uh, and to encourage um, the, the vibrancy of our nighttime economy and to ensure that as we move forward in terms of the recovery, we have a plan. Marguerite has spoken a little bit about show love TO and the varying parts of that. It is also that um, any member of council uh, obviously um, should ensure that they bring forward ideas, uh, initiatives that are taking place within their specific wards in collaboration with um, businesses and residents as a whole to bring that forward. But of course, you know, we have our medical health folks, we have fire, we have police, we have BIAs, we have everyone involved as part of this um, process in terms of establishing the framework for the nighttime economy and so on. And a lot of work is actually happening. We know that the challenges that we're facing right now with the pandemic will not last forever and the city of Toronto will be strong going forward, where there's a lot of lessons that we're learning, a lot of things that we're actually putting in place. We have lots of talented men and women in the artistic community, you know, the, the DIY um, sector and, is, is an event and, 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 and so on is, is, is growing. Um, we, we look as well as addressing the issue around the, the external working group around sexual assaults, uh, harm reduction, and looking at Toronto as a destination. So there's a vast array of work that's actually being done in this, in this uh, sector. So, um, you know, as we look at our current priorities, which is around recovery, what we're doing there, reviewing and updating our city processing, um, we also look at the issues around noise, the impact, and so on. So we have to find ways to ensure that as we move forward, we become more efficient, we reduce the cumbersomeness of uh, the application processes and the red tapes that uh, people generally complain about and so on, and it's, it's something that's important. We've already discerned and heard around the impact on the bars, the restaurants, the nightclub, and the music venues that uh, Mr. Cohen has spoken about and so on, and you know, the, 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 the way that we're going to animate our nighttime economy is going to be absolutely amazing for the city and um, it is going to take place as a result of a collaboration with TMAC and all of the musicians and the performers and the cultural sector in this city to ensure that Toronto, when we do rebound and recover, we will actually do so with a, with a more um, energized uh, way and in in, in format and that we are moving towards success and that we were looking at how we, for example, streamline our online uh, processes and so on to help uh, event organizers to make things easier, to make things more efficient, and to ensure that we generate the economic impact um, that we want for this city. There's a tremendous amount of work that's actually being done. I want to congratulate our staff team who are working on this, as well as the uh, external advisory bodies, who is actually quite reflected of the diversity of this city in this space and the field. So with that, I'd like to move this item. Um, so all those in favor? Opposed, that's carried. Thank you very much. The item has been dealt with. And we are moving back now to uh, Ms. Uh, Zabidnu, um, whether or not, uh, is she on? This is moving now to EC 16.7, which is the current um, impact on the pandemic on the live music venues. Lisa, are you on the line? Mr. Zabitnew? Lisa, please unmute your phone. Hello, Lisa, you've also called into the meeting. We've unmuted you from our end, but your phone may also be on mute. Please unmute your phone. Okay, so we'll hold that down for another moment. Councillor Cressy, why don't we go to 
your item, which is a new business, um, EC 16.9, which is a child care update. Uh, you had circulated the, uh, the letter. I think members have had a chance to review that. So if, you, if there are any questions uh, on that item, Councillor Cressy is available. If there are no questions, Councillor Cressy, um, uh, you may wish to speak on it. So I'm just looking to see if there is any hands to suggest that there's a questioning. I see none. So Councillor Cressy, over to you. Oh, and, and thank you, Chair, and I can be very brief. Uh, this is just to say that as part of the annual five-year review, the province has announced some proposed changes to the Child Care Act. Uh, just like we did five years ago, our city staff consulted on those and came to committee and council with uh, their recommended response. Uh, and so this is simply a request in light of the province uh, recently proposing changes for our staff to go and consult once again and come back to committee with their suggested response. So I, I can leave it at that. I don't need to be broader. I think it's pretty straightforward. Thank you very much, Councillor Cressy. Members, the uh, motion's on the screen. Yeah. So, Councillor uh, members, there is an amendment on the uh, amendment on the uh, screen. All those in favour? Opposed? That carries. Item as amended. All those in favour? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. So we're going. Is Lisa on this one? Okay. So, um, Lisa Zabidnu, are you on? The line? Lisa, are you there? Hello, Lisa. Okay, I'm just going to call her one more time. And you've reached out to her. Lisa? Lisa Zabinu? Okay, just close that off now. Okay. All right, Councillor Cressy, we're going to bring this in. Uh, you have an update as you had also with respect to EC 16.6. Uh, we're at 16.7, which is the um, current impact on the, of the pandemic um, on live music venues. You have an update. I do, and thank you. And I, I can place the, the motion. Uh, this is uh, in front of us is are the recommendations from TMAC. Of course, on Friday, the province and the feds announced changes, including to the emergency commercial rent assistance program, which meant that some of the amendments were no longer required or needed to be adjusted. So thanks to the tremendous work of Mike Williams, Marguerite, and, and Mike, uh, we have the revised version in front of us. Uh, and so just a few comments very briefly on this. I spoke on the previous item to musicians and support for them. This is about support for venues. Uh, and we heard from Jeff Cohen, of course, uh, Everybody knows Jeff from the Horseshoe and Lees and many other places. Unfortunately, we didn't hear from Lisa, but we had a very significant conversation at TMAC uh, a few weeks ago on this. I can tell you we have lost since COVID started 11 music, live music venues in the city of Toronto, 11. And, and it's not hyperbole to say that the risk through COVID is not losing another 11, but perhaps losing nearly all of our grassroots live music venues. And, and I say that without hyperbole. A, a study that uh, the mayor and deputy mayor Thompson and I and Councillor Bailau were part of releasing last week showed that more than 95% of venues say they don't know if they can survive the next six months financially. And so the objective here, and this is what the amendment, the, the motions from TMAC amended by staff speak to, is not just to save live music venues during COVID, but to strengthen them coming out of it. And so there are mechanisms that, you know, we should be very proud as councillors that City Council passed and implemented retroactively. The world's first live music venue tax subclass. It's already rolled out more than 50 venues or nearly 50 venues qualified. Two million dollars is being distributed based on that. That's a huge step and it is truly a lifeline. But I think what we've heard from the live music industry is that it's not a silver bullet in and of itself. And so in front of us are recommendations for all levels of government collectively to continue doing more for the province around financial support uh, and a ban on evictions for music businesses, but also, and this speaks to what Jeff Cohen talked about, to actually have fair and clear 
live music reopening guidelines and for us to work and go to work with the province to ensure that happens, for the country to make permanent the live music fund, and for the city, there's two pieces in front of us here, and one which I'll bring your attention to. One is to make permanent the tax subclass, an important measure coming out of COVID, but the other is for the city to explore, and this is at staff's advice, a group insurance program for live music venues where we can step in to help be part of the solution. And so we, we can't come out of COVID losing the entire live music sector or a significant part of it. We need all levels of government to work together. And while we can be proud of what we've done thus far as a city, the, the time is of the essence to do more. And so I'll, I'll close there, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for your relentless leadership on this file in particular. And once again, to the members of TMAC and our music office and EDC staff, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Cressy, and certainly thank you for your leadership on TMAC and sharing and the work that you're doing there. And thank certainly all of our uh, staff team, Mike Tanner and, and team and so on. So I won't belabor the point uh, any further other than simply to ask that we vote on the amendments that you have put forward. So all those in favor of the amendments, oppose that's carried. Uh, item as amended, all those in favor, oppose that's carried. And um, members, we have reached the end of uh, the committee's uh, agenda items for today. And I would ask that we have a motion to adjourn. And just before we do that, I want to thank the clerks, the staff, and the, uh, the IT and everyone, and all the staff who have participated and those who were available to participate in this um, meeting today and of course all of the people who've come forward to speak to us to bring their concerns to us and I apologize um, uh, to um, Lisa Zabidniu who we are not able to connect with. The staff have assured me that they've tried everything possible uh, but we're not able to connect with her and so on so I regret that deeply because Lisa who is the owner of the Phoenix um, nightclub as well as she's also a part of our um, external advisory uh, for the nighttime economy. She has so much to contribute. Uh, maybe as a suggestion, maybe if she wishes to put something in writing, uh, that could be then brought forward to council to be able to convey her thoughts and, uh, and ideas that she wished to pass on to us today. But I deeply regret that we're not able to hear from you, Lisa but we know that you have so much to contribute. So I apologize for us not being able to get, I don't know what the issues are. Staff are going to look at it to ensure that um, we can uh, perhaps avoid this from happening again. So Madam Clerk, I think we've done everything to try to connect her and so on. I deeply, um, you know, uh, it, I regret that uh, we're not able to connect with her and so on. So I want to thank everyone. So with that um, motion from uh, Vice Chair Grimes to adjourn, all those in favor, opposed, that's carried. Thank you very much, members. Stay safe and healthy. All the best. Cheers. Chair, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lai.